members. Welcome to the Planning Applications Committee meeting of the 15th of February. We are quoted. Nick, can you confirm Cedrant and apologies, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, with apologies from Councillor Tate and from Councillor Fairburn for lateness. Um, we have 19 members present at the start of the meeting. Thank you, Nick. Declarations of interest, members? Archie? Thanks, Chair. It's, it's not a declaration, a declaration. It's just to say that I have had the, um, I listened to the developer at uh, AM number five. Uh, I've made no, no judgments on that, so therefore it's just uh, a matter of record that I've actually had uh, listened to the developer on this. Thanks for that, Archie. Other members? Okay, thank you. Minute of the meeting of the 11th of January 2018, members, is that a true record? And are you content that this is correct minute? Agree. Thank you. Can everyone remember to switch off their telephones or put them in silent, please? And uh, Nick, can you take us through the process for today? Oh, and I should say before that that uh, please remember that this meeting will be recorded and the uh, recording will be, made, will be made available for public listening if requested. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, Chair. The Planning Applications Committee will consider each application in turn as detailed on the agenda. The case officer or other appointed officer will make a short presentation addressing the determining issues accompanied by digital images. Any late information, amendments or corrections will be reported at this time. Members may ask questions of officers following the presentation on points of clarification. The Chairman has been provided with a list of eligible representatives who have registered to speak at this meeting within the period specified in Council policy. No other persons will be allowed to speak. The Chairman will individually invite those who have registered in advance to speak to make their presentation, after which they may be questioned by committee members. No questions may be asked of members. The order of eligible parties being heard will be as follows. Third parties objecting to an application. Third parties supporting an application. Statutory consultees objecting to an application. Elected members of Dumfries and Galloway Council who are not members of the Planning Applications Committee. Such members should withdraw from the committee chamber after making their presentation. Applicants or their agents. Representors have been placed in alphabetical order and a copy of the public speaking list is available from the committee officer taking notes of our proceedings. Presentations will be strictly limited to three minutes per person, excepting for national and major developments, which by their very nature are more complex, where the time limit will be five minutes. The chairman of the committee will ask you to come, f to, come to a conclusion if you take too long. Representors are encouraged to use the time allotted to clarify any points they consider material and address the determining issues. Certain matters are not normally material planning considerations and will not be taken into account by the Council when deciding on a planning application. Representors should not raise any new matters without explaining why they were not raised earlier with the case officer. Please do not repeat what is in the report as members will have already read the report. After all the representations have been heard, the meeting is then in formal session and no members of the public may address the committee from the public gallery. The Planning Applications Committee will then proceed to determine the application or, where appropriate, agree a recommendation to be made to full council who will determine the application. Thanks very, thanks very much, Nick. In case any members need to note and in case there's anyone from the public gallery Interested in agenda item number seven, which is land adjacent to Drumcreef Cottages, Drumcreef, Drumcreef House, Moffat. That has been withdrawn from the agenda by the agent, so item seven will not be considered today. So any member of the public that's here for item seven, it will not be considered at this meeting today. Okay, and then we can move on to agenda item number four which is the erection of a meteorological mast, maximum height 90 metres, for a temporary period of three years at land on Bradshaw, Bradshaw Rig, six kilometres east of Thornhill. The application type is a full application, 
The recommendation is to approve subject conditions. The reference number is 17 stroke 1829 stroke full. And the case officer is Andrew Robinson. Andrew, will you take us through your presentation, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just before I start, I'd just like to draw your attention to uh, an error that we noticed in the report after it was published. The number of, uh, and the number of objections uh, stated in Section 3 of the report should actually be 44. Um, the representative, Tam Hill, was um, sadly omitted from the list, although that individual was sent a letter notifying them of the committee arrangements and inviting them to speak, but there should actually be 44 representatives objecting to the application, not 43. Um, so the application site is, uh, is situated at Bradeshaw Rig, uh, which is situated on open moorland um, to the east of Thornhill at the foot of the southern uplands, as illustrated on the slide. And uh, the site, it's situated to the south of the U475 public road um, to the east of a layer of trees. And the nearest property to the, to the site is Fellend, which is just at the top there. Um, the application is for the temporary erection of a meteorological mast with a maximum height of 90 metres that would be supported by uh, guy wires at various intervals on a monologue pole. And this is the, these are the photographs of the application site. It shows the approximate position of the mass. So this is looking um, southeast towards the proposed site from the public road. And I've also highlighted the nearest property as well in relation to that. And, and this is the road network leading effectively to the site so you can see as well the, the property uh, in the photograph and the site being at the transition of the landscape from the southern uplands to um, into a, a forestry landscape and this is looking down on the site from the public road which is actually at a higher land level than the site and again that's a, a zoomed in view uh, of the site and that's the the view that would of the site from the nearest residential property. Uh, this is taken further in into the landscape looking back towards the site at the same land level approximately as the application site. And in terms of the surrounding landscape that's looking back towards uh, Thornhill and Gatelaw Bridge from the local road network. Um, the landscape to the north is the, is the start of the Southern Uplands range uh, that's the landscape to the east. You can see the transition between the two landscape characters. Um, this is looking from the, um, a farm to the west of the site called Townfoot, and the application site would be over the, the ridge, somewhere in that direction. And this is a wider view. This is actually coming out of Thornhill between Kirkland of Morton and Kelson Bridge, looking towards the vicinity of the site. So that was the farm that was in the previous slide and, in, and the application site would be into, into that distance there. So the uh, application, it's concluded that the mass would not have a, a significant impact on landscape character or visual amenity for the reasons stated in the report for the period it would be in situ. Uh, views would be restricted to the local road network largely where the mast pole would be mainly visible uh, and due to the diminishing visibility longer range views of the mast are unlikely so it, the application is recommended for approval subject to the conditions stated. Thank you Andrew. Do any members have any questions for the case officer? Okay. In that case we have four objectors, there's been one objector added to the list that we didn't pick up. Oh Patsy? I have just one, and it's on page nine under location open spaces, uh, and it's from um, been raised by Thornhill Community Council, and it says that the application will be in direct conflict with the Dumfries and Gallery Draft Open Space Strategy 2014. I just would like clarification on that from you, if we could, please. Andrew, the open space strategy is really relevant to open spaces within the settlements and villages so not land like this the open space strategy is is more focused on the different typology of open spaces within settlements like thornhill or within villages so it's not really applicable to this development it's not open space in the context of, of this location Thanks, 
to another member. In that case, we have, a, we have four objectors. A new addition is Mr. David Formston. If you'd like to come forward, David, please. There is a microphone in front of you. You will be... David, your presentation will be restricted to three minutes. Okay. And uh, remember, we are dealing with a, an anemometer mast and not a wind farm application. But uh, whenever you're ready, and we'll be, I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go uh, to just draw your presentation to a conclusion. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Yes, uh, good morning. Um, I'm speaking here in a personal capacity, but also as a representative of the Thornhill Enhancement Group, which has been working very actively with council officers and the community council to Im improve the environment of Thornhill. I'd like to focus on the visual impact of the proposed mast uh, on the landscape of Nisdale, um, on the tourist industry, and on the Thornhill um, village as a good place to live. I think the mast will be very visible across a huge swathe of Nisdale. In my written submission, I, I showed the relative, by contours, I showed the relative heights, looking from Thornhill, looking from Drumlanrig, and if you add the height of the mast, there's no doubt that it will be visible from a, um, a large, much larger area than is maybe implied by the report. The mast will be less than three kilometres from a sizable settlement of Gate Law Bridge, um, I think the officer's report rightly focuses on the close-in impact of the mast, um, but the visual dominance of locally will also be uh, complemented, I think, by a much more dramatic view from the A76. Um, uh, the mast will certainly be visible from uh, the main road going by contours. The letter from Arcus on behalf of the applicant DDF concedes that some landscape and visual effects will inevitably occur, but notes that the visibility of the mast is not considered significant, and I would have to ask by whom um, it will be significant for those living in um, and visiting Nisdale. The EDF report admits that there will be an impact on the landscape and on tourism, um, but their only justification for this is that the fact that the short-term nature of the mast but I don't think this bodes well for any future wind farm application, which EDF are clear they would follow if the site was deemed to be suitable. Moving on to the economic impact, tourism is clearly one of the few remaining industries of the local economy, and the wonderful unspoiled scenery <coughs> of Nisdale is its biggest asset. Economically, Thornhill is seen as a growth area with the local plan, including provision for an extra 150 housing units and we need to attract people to come and live in these units, and they're likely to be deterred by a view of a mast and um, by the, the thought that a wind farm might be overlooking uh, the village uh, being on the cards. You have 30 seconds to go, David. Okay. The panoramic views of the lowland hills are um, looking uh, are, are one of the glories of, uh, as I've said, the peculiar state has wisely elected not to cite its own proposed wind farms in view of the castle. It's recognised that the, uh, the officer's report saying it's recognised that the purpose of the proposed mast is to establish the potential suitability of the location for wind energy development. And I would conclude with a warning from Oliver Mundell, who's recently described the risk of creating a metal cordon around local villages which will be completely engulfed. And I think you can see this starting with Sanka. Finally, this committee will be well aware of its responsibility to balance short-term financial gain for landowners. Okay. Is that, is that you concluded? No, just one more sentence. Go on there. Okay, the, the committee will be well aware of its responsibility to balance short-term financial gain for landowners and multinational companies with the safeguarding of what I believe to a unique landscape for this and future generations. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, David. Any members have any questions for David? In that case, David, you'd like to resume your seat. Thank you very much Thank for your you. presentation. We now have uh, Mike Steele. Mike, speaking as a, a, an individual, he'll then retake his seat and he'll be asked back later on to represent a Closeburn Community Council. So, Mike, again, same thing, please try and refrain from discussions about wind farms and uh, you have three minutes whenever you're ready. And I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, councillors. Um, I have two quick points I want to make, um, because I will come back, as Chairman has said, to talk about the fact that this is a scenic area designated by you, uh, Dumfries and Gallery Council, as one that we need to cherish. And as an individual, I've lived um, in Nistel for 32 years, and I cherish the um, ambience of the landscape that we have. The two points I want to make is that uh, there's a pre pres presumption in both the report and the letter that was referred to by my colleague just now, that three years is an insignificant period. And I just want to say that that is not the case. A three-year prison sentence, which is what this uh, proposal gives to Midnesdale, is a significant period. And thus, damage will be done, as has been alluded to, to the amenity for the residents who live here and to the tourist potential um, that we want to foster in this part of the world. So be under no illusions that this is a significant uh, proposal. It may or may not lead to other things. We shall see. Um, the other point I want to make is that, is there really need? Um, we have a changing climate, um, as exampled by this winter. And so it's very difficult to predict what the future will be in terms of wind speed. This mast is to collect information. This information is, in general, already available. And will three years' worth of experience enable you to predict the next 25? I would find that very doubtful indeed. Um, Mr Chairman, I'm going to stop there and save you some minutes and come back and talk on behalf of the Council in a few moments. Thank can, you I, very much. can I finally say that the pictures you've been showed show underrate the beauty of the mid Nistel, and they are, as my colleague said, very close in. The panoramic views there are very, very different, particularly under different conditions. Thanks, Mike. Before you leave, if you're finished, uh, members might want to ask you questions. I realise you're coming back to represent Closeburn Community Council, but any members have any questions for Mike and the presentation is made to date? In that case, if you're finished, Mike, Mike will ask you back later. Thank you. Hey, next we have Thornhill Community Council. Is it Melanie Allen? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Melanie, the same again. We will have your presentation whenever you're ready. Uh, it's three minutes, and I will remind you with 30 seconds to go just to draw your presentation to a conclusion. Thank you. Travelling north as you enter the outskirts of Closeburn, a panoramic view of the surrounding landscape is revealed, sharing the beauty of the Nith Valley from the Keir Hills through to Tinron Dune, moving across to Deer and the Lowther Hills. Beyond, in my mind, why should the awesomeness of this view not compare to the likes of Glencoe? Within the Galloway and Southern Ayrshire biosphere, it's a beautifully unique landscape, rich in historic value, with Closeburn and Thornhill at the heart of this stunning part of Dumfries and Galloway. The proposal to place a 90 metre high metal structure with 60 metre wide guy ropes in any aspect of this beautiful landscape simply does not make sense. Of course, the applicant and their agents have significant commercial interest, so they're going to discount and play down the large number of objections raised by the community, which with their intention were specific to this mast application. However, at no point has there been any community engagement or dialogue. Indeed, it seems clear they have not done the minimum, they have done the minimum required and completely dismissed the significance of the much wider communities across Nithdale. However, despite the view I described at the beginning, the recommendation made to you today is to approve the application on the basis it will have no detrimental impact on the landscape character. We believe this opinion is wrong. We would strongly argue this recommendation for approval is taking an exceptionally narrow-minded view. Visitors come to Midnissdale as a key destination because of its history, heritage, and to get back to nature. And they are in awe of the natural beauty and open space. D&G desperately needs to retain and encourage tourism without taking these first steps to taint that landscape. Surely we do not want views from historic sites like Drumlanrig, Morton, 
or Thornhill polluted in any way. There is a huge value placed locally over the wealth of history these hills afford. We urge you to consider the importance of archaeology, particularly in light of the huge throws each guide rope extends out to. Temporary or not, after three years, the damage will already be done. You have 30 seconds to go, Melanie. Thank you. There is great concern to threat to birds and wildlife. There have been no studies to specifically identify the impact on important, important species or habitats. We urge this planning committee to stand up, be recognised and to maintain the protection of these few, few remaining glorious unspoilt landscapes in Dumfries and Galloway. We ask each of you to wholeheartedly reject this application on your watch and in your time. Let a precedent be set today. Refuse the application. Make now time to cherish our unspoilt landscape. Thank you, Melanie. Do any members have any questions for Melanie at this time? Okay, thank you very much, Melanie. Thank you. you resume your seat. Thank you. Uh, we have Mike Steele again, and this time Mike is speaking on behalf of Closeburn Community Council. Mike. Mr Chairman, uh, Councillors, um, in this particular instance, I want to concentrate very much on the fact that this is a regional senior carrier, and I have referenced the technical paper, a local development plan technical paper, September 2014, uh, which sets out uh, why these areas were set up. There are 10 in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, they were set up to provide protection to those areas of special scientific, uh, sorry, uh, scenic interest, which form our most cherished landscapes. Um, some of the very best of Scotland's renowned landscapes are in Dumfries and Galloway. They attract visitors and, uh, and they provide an amenity for people to live here, to work and to play here. It states in the report that um, they were set up with the onus on local planning authorities to safeguard the most cherished, the most outstanding beauty spots and to encourage the provision of visitor facilities. The intention was that there should be a strong presumption against development within designated areas. And I would argue that this is a development because it has a significant effect on what uh, will happen to the area. So I ask you, why are we putting up 90 uh, metres of metal mast in front of some of the most iconic hills that we have in Nisdale? I would like to take the, uh, the report to task in that it suggests the background is forestry. That is the case if you look at it from the north, as you saw in the photographs. But if you look at it from close then and you look at it from the A76, the, the backdrop is very much the Lowther Hills. They're domed, they're um, beautiful in, in these conditions. And if you stick a metal mask up in front of them, it doesn't fit. It's like sticking a straw in your scooped ice cream. One lot's round and the other lot's not. Um, so I would suggest that it will damage the environment. It will chase people away. This mast will be to its tip 800 feet above the A76, as you'll see it. So it will be very tall and it will be very visible. Um, it's going to be seen from a long way. The panorama, which you did not get in your photographs, is the view that most people will see of it. And you need photographs taken from a distance. There's an argument that you can't see it from a distance. That's not correct. You will do, because it will, it will break the skyline for you. And the panorama is very important to those of us who live in Closeburn, um, where I'm the Secretary of the Community Council, and those travelling along the main road, and those who live in Thornhill. It will be something that draws your attention, and I would argue that it's a, a damaging attention uh, and, and something that we do not wish. You it will, to go, Mike. Thank you very much. It will discourage people to return, and we need people to return. So walkers and bikers and fishermen will note it and not come back. I would finally like to say that the developers uh, for this have not engaged with us on a letter back in October. And I would invite them to our next Community Council meeting on the 12th of April to talk to us, please, and to bring along the landowner, because we need a conversation on these sorts of things. A hydro scheme would be a lot better than a wind turbine one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Do any members have any questions on Mike's presentation on behalf of Closeburn Community Council? In that case, Mike, if you'd like to resume your seat, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Chairman, Councillor. Thank you very much. Okay, that concludes the objectives. We now have 
Torsten Frost, the applicant. You will have the same three minutes, sir, and I will remind you with 30 seconds to go just to bring your presentation to a conclusion. Okay. Thank you. Um, good morning, Mr Chair and councillors. My name is Torsten Frost, and I work as a project manager for EDF Energy Renewables. We understand that wind farm developments can be contentious, and we've seen a number of objections to this application. This is only an application for a wind monitoring mast. Its purpose is to gather wind data, and it's one of the first steps in assessing a site's potential for a wind farm. It's of increasing importance to get this information at an early stage, and that's to ensure there's sufficient wind resource which allows a competitive wind farm to be designed. It's only once we have this information that we'll make an overall decision on whether the site is suitable for a wind farm and what that wind farm could look like. This decision will take into account the other key considerations which have been raised by others here today. If the project were to progress forwards, any proposals would be subject to a full consultation exercise in advance of submitting any planning application. The application before you doesn't preclude any application for a wind farm being determined based on its own merits. And it doesn't in any way set a precedent for a wind farm or bind the council in taking a view on the acceptance of a wind farm in this location. The mast is a slender temporary structure and limited in its presence. Your planning officer notes that it won't have any significant adverse impacts on landscape, tourism and other considerations. I therefore ask that you support his recommendation and approve this application. Thank you. Thank you, Torsten. Does any member of the committee have any questions for Torsten, the applicant? Ivor? Why did you choose this site and is it a case of looking for windy areas first or is it looking at areas that are acceptable under the local plan for development? So every, every development or every consideration of development is a balance. So where so the Scottish Government is still very pro-wind and with the market conditions what we need to do is we need to find the sites that on balance we think could be commercially viable sites. So the key is wind, but there are a lot of other factors that we need to, consideration, uh, we need to consider. So it comes into that overall balance in that decision that we'll be making. So um, everyone will have a different approach, but we think it's key to understand almost the resources across a, a range of sites before deciding you know, wh which have the most promise overall as a package in terms of how we could deliver a wind farm which can be consented at a, at a commercially viable uh, rate, if that makes sense. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? In that case, sir, if you'd like to resume your seat, thank you very much. Members, we are now in session. Thanks. Archie? <coughs> and then and thank, Patsy. Thank, thanks very much, sir. Um, I know we've had all these in front of us before several times through the last 10, 15 years. Um, and each time, you know, we, we, we get the same um, object and objections, and, and quite rightly so, they're, they're, they're rightly to come forward, um, considering what could happen in the future. But we have to deal with this as a, as a matter of, of one application for, for a thing like that. We have dealt with, with these masks in the past, and... and, and I understand the concern that the local community actually has, but there, when you look at planning reasons in, in, in Dumfries and Galloway, there, there's very little that I think there is any need to not um, go with the, the, the recommendations in this particular report. However, we have in the past suggested that the length of time that these masts are actually up can be reduced to two years. And, and, and I would make that suggestion, Chair. Just to confirm it, is it a suggestion or a proposal? I'm quite happy to propose it if it's required. Okay. Patsy? Yes, it's, um, just one of the officers could help. It's just this um, thing that was raised about a regional scenic area and what a regional scenic area is meant to do in protecting a regional scenic area and uh, how, if there's a conflict here. 
Andrew or David or David. Thank you, Chair. This is covered by Local Development Plan Policy NE2, and I'll just quote you what that actually says. Is the siting and design of development within a regional scenic area should respect the special qualities of the area. Development within or which affects regional scenic areas may be supported where the local council is satisfied that the landscape character and scenic interest for which the area has been designated would not be significantly adversely affected or there's a specific need for the development at that location which could not be located in a less sensitive area. So obviously the, taking the second issue first, without prejudice to any future wind farm application, obviously what the applicant is looking at here is this specific site. So therefore the, the second bit about the specific need at that location, there is nowhere else that they could put it if they're looking at that specific site. The critical phrase in the first section is significantly adversely affect the regional scenic area. Our view as officers here is that the landscape character and scenic interest would not be significantly adversely affected by a slimline lattice mast on a temporary basis. And I, thanks, Bart. I think it's worth noting that the LDP2 doesn't change from LDP1, so the same set of uh, circumstances are, are, are encapsulated in both the current and the, the, the proposed LDP. Uh, David? Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I share um, with the objectors the, the feeling that um, the Vries and Galloway's landscape is our greatest single asset, and also that uh, tourism is our best chance to grow our local economy. However, that's perhaps a subjective opinion, so we are charged here to look at this objectively, and um, as I understand it, the um, overarching policy is the, the cornerstone of, of our planning policy. Uh, I'm looking here at uh, general immunity under OP1. Development proposals should be compatible with the character, and I paraphrase, of the area. And it goes on in the, under landscape. Development proposals should respect, protect, and or enhance the region's rich landscape character and scenic qualities, including features and sites identified the landscape qualities or sense of wildness at any level. And then I go to OP2. Development proposals should achieve high quality design in terms of their contribution to the existing built and natural environment, contributing positively to a sense of place and local distinctiveness. I mean, so reading those two policies, OP1 and OP2, I don't think there's any way we can, uh, we can um, allow this. So I'd like to remove that we, uh, move that we refuse this application on those two grounds. OP, they contradict it to OP1 and OP2. Okay, if we get to that, I'll ask David or Andrew just to clarify what their position is on that or their opinion is on that. Uh, Ian? It was very similar to what David was, was saying there, actually. There you go. And I picked it up under page 15, uh, paragraph 4.7. It's quite explicit there, I felt. that, And it is. It's, it's, it's our determination today, certainly of recommendations from, uh, from our officers, and, and that's certainly a view. But in my view, taking, taking into consideration what we've heard from the local objectors and the local community, I should say, in particular, and the, the, the developer them, them, themselves, I think that there, there is a case, as David's already set out, that a case for refusing this, in fact, because of the adverse impact it has on the, the local scenic area. Okay. Uh, Douglas? <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm mindful that uh, with the advancement of technology and innovation, wind farms will come and go, but one thing that we want to protect is archaeology. Um, and I noted on page 10 in the archaeologist report that he recommended a programme of archaeological work to be carried out. Um, he also recommended the use of a low pressurised vehicle for traversing the areas of archaeological interest and this hasn't been included in the conditions. Could I have a bit of clarification of why it's not been included? Is this an oversight and if it is, could we if we're minded to approve this application, that it's the condition is amended. Thank you. I'm sure we could introduce that if, if required, just simply in a condition of our own. Uh, 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 John? Thank you, Chair. Very similar to my colleague, another aspect is the black grouse. That, and three times it's mentioned that no work should be carried out during a period of three months. And... Similarly, this has not been included in the conditions either, that no work it has. 
It is. I apologise. I think what, what we haven't included is whether it's the 1st of March or the 31st of March and the beginning of May or the end of May, we maybe want to extend it. It says in, in during the month. Okay. If that's the case, but apparently that's been dealt with as well. Okay, so OP1 and OP2, Andrew. That uh, uh, David suggests that that would be sufficient to refuse the application. It be a, a basis for refusal. Maybe ask David. Is that right? Well, obviously, it's a matter for yourselves as a committee. As officers, we don't consider that. As I said again, that the significant uh, adverse impact would be such to justify refusal under OP1 or OP2, but. Uh, it's a competent motion if that is the, the opinion of the, the committee. Okay, currently we have a motion to approve, which hasn't had a seconder, and we have a proposal to refuse, and that second is, so that would be the motion, A. Eh, Jen Maitland? Uh, Chairman, I am um, quite prepared to second Councillor Dreiber's motion. Um, I think it's important that the committee recognises that we fight battles that we might have a chance of winning. I would suggest that this is a temporary proposal. It's a very slim um, physical change to the landscape for two years. I would suggest to members that we uh, keep our powder dry for problems that might emerge in the future and keep that to one side. Uh, I suggest that this one is something that we should probably allow to go through. I understand the problems, I fully understand the community concern, but we've got to deal with physical changes to landscape. And in this particular case, I don't think it's so uh, bad that it would be um, uh, uh, justifiable to refuse it. Okay, so as it stands, David? I'd just like to comment on uh, Councillor Maitland's uh, Remarks no, I know you've got a comment. You've got a motion which is competent. Oh, we're going to vote now, are we? Pardon? Sorry, what can I do? Well, the, the, there's no need to have a debate about it. Your opinion is that it's not acceptable, and Jane's opinion is that it is, so just go to the vote. That, that you have a, a competent motion. Your motion is competent, and the amendment is, I presume, competent as well. Are there any other speakers? Jim McComb, Ivor. Chair, I'm seeking clarification. Is the motion to go with the recommendation but reduce the period to two years? No, I'll have Nick clarify at the end. The motion is to refuse because that was the first competent right. one. And the amendment is Archie and Jane saying we go with the officer's recommendation with the additional a uh, point that Douglas has asked to be put in about uh, low pressure vehicles and uh, limiting the time to two years. So that's the amendment. But Nick will clarify that anyway once uh, all speakers have had the opportunity to do so. Ivor, you've withdrawn your, your request to speak. Is there anybody else wanting to speak? I guess we've got the motion. Uh, go to the, Nick, can you confirm what the motion amendment is, please? Oh, did you want to speak again, no? I just wanted to clarify um, who was seconding the motion. Well, that was definitely, as the Chair said, that, that was myself in regards to the 4.7 in particular, OP1, OP2, I think. But if you've got that, that level, I would them. Any two is relevant, of course, but we've emphasised OP1, OP2. Okay, Nick, just got the vote. Okay, so we, we, have the, we have the motion proposed by Councillor James, seconded by Councillor Carruthers. Um, to refuse the application on the grounds that it is contrary to um, policies OP1 and OP2 um, and the ad adverse impact of the um, application. Um, and we have the amendment from Councillor Driver, seconded by Councillor Mait Maitland, um, to um, approve the application but um, subject to a two year temporary permission rather than three as as um, submitted and a low pressure vehicle. Yep, and an additional condition in relation to um, use of a low pressure vehicle for access in the site okay. so if we move to the vote now 
Um, Councillor Dempster. Amendment. Councillor John Campbell. Amendment. Councillor Blake. Amendment. Councillor Doogie Campbell. Amendment. Councillor Carruthers. Motion. Councillor Driver. Amendment. Councillor Ferguson. Amendment. Councillor Gilroy. Councillor Juicy. Amendment. Councillor Hagman. Amendment. Councillor Hislop. Councillor James. Okay. Councillor Lever. Amendment. Councillor Maitland. Amendment. Councillor Martin. Motion. Councillor McComb. Motion. Councillor McKee. Amendment. Councillor Murray. Amendment. Councillor Young. Amendment. So we have six members voting in favour of the motion and 13 in favour of the amendment. Therefore, the amendment is carried. Um, so the application is approved subject to the two-year temporary permission and the additional condition. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. We go on to agenda item number five. <coughs> Alterations and extension to existing caravan site to include 315 static caravans and 40 seasonal tourers to supersede the existing 102 static caravans and 117 touring caravans and improvement to sewage treatment plant at Queensbury Bay, Powfoot, Annan. The application type, the full application, the recommendation is to approve subject conditions. The reference number is 16 stroke P stroke 4 stroke 0120 and the case officer is Andrew Robinson again. Andrew, would you, just like us, would you just like to take us through your presentation, please? Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, this, this application incorporates the existing site and an extension to the existing site, and it's an existing uh, caravan site located to the west of uh, Powfoot, um, as illustrated on the side, slide there. Um, this is the existing plan of the site, and at the moment it has... 102 static caravans and uh, permission as well for 117 touring caravans um, to the site. And this is the, the most up-to-date site plan that the agent has submitted, which shows the, the, the current layout of, of the park. So it includes the existing caravans and the touring areas as well. What's proposed is, is an extension to the park which would actually have a total of up to 315 static caravans and 40 seasonal tours with a layout um, similar to this. Um, and what the proposal would also do is, is it's sought to effectively include a new permission for the existing areas as well. So it does include the existing static caravans uh, on the site. Uh, the application was accompanied with a landscape visual impact assessment and this is a, a, a ZTV, which uh, zone of theoretical visibility, which shows as a worst case uh, scenario the, the visual impact of the development. And there were seven viewpoints um, with the landscape and visual impact and they're sort of illustrated here. Four of them are, are in close proximity of the site and the, the other three are from wider range views. So viewpoint one, this is taken from uh, Powfoot uh, Golf Course. So you, the existing appearance is at the top and at the bottom that's after one year. And what the um, LVI is also included is 
uh, a, mo a photo montage after 15 years of what landscaping around the site uh, could appear in order to screen the development. So that's uh, showing what it, what it could look like in the future with a suitable landscaping treatment. Uh, the, the next few points are on um, the U91 road, which actually leads from Cummer Trees. Um, so existing at the top, proposed at the bottom, that's the uh, caravans just there. And that's again in, in 15 years time with landscaping. Uh, ex that's just a little bit further along the road. That's the proposed development there. And again, after 15 years. And viewpoint four is taken just before uh, at the bottom end of the road. So there's a farmstead in here. So that's existing view, proposed view after a year, and then after 15 years. Uh, the next three sides, these are just from further away, so it doesn't have the same level of detail, but it, it's really just to show the, the, the site within the landscape, which it's shown is just there. This is to the east of the site, so it's actually, so there's Powfoot, and this is actually taken along a coastal path um, to the east of Powfoot, and the application site is just there. And then this is taken from the other side of the Solway, so, so quite a way away from the site. So I'll just go see some photographs of the site and surrounding area. This is upon entering the site. Um, that's the current appearance of the site, just to give you an idea of what it's what it looks like at the moment. Um, this is coming towards the northern part of the site, where where this uh, the, this part of the site has permission for tourers at present. So then you've got still the existing site and then beyond the layer of trees goes into the area where the extension is proposed. And that's looking back at the, uh, at the park from the northeastern corner. So this is the area proposed the extension. So that's looking northwest, it's looking north and east. So it's a, just an, it's, it's an area of, uh, of, of um, grassland at present which is enclosed by hedge boundary treatment. And that's looking back. This, there's a private access road that, that, um, that goes into the site from, from the road leading from Cummer Trees. And this is taken from, um, from that road. So this is actually looking right across the site from the west over. And that's the, the private access track which, uh, which leads to the, to the site um, from this road that leads from Cummer Trees, which isn't actually open to the public to access the site from there. Uh, the next few sites I've actually taken, these are photographs of the road network in, in Powfoot. So this is approaching the Powfoot Bridge, and it's a, it's a Category C listed bridge. Um, so you can, sh you can see from this slide, it's wide enough for one vehicle only. Um, and that's then there is a bend on the bridge as well as illustrated here. And then over the bridge, and then this is looking back from f into Powfoot. This is an approximate position where the, the adoption of the road ends. There's a car park just by the golf club uh, at the entrance of the golf club. And then beyond that, it turns into a private road, which the applicants confirm that they have control over. And that's the width. Of the of the road at present leading to the park, and then this is the the entrance to the park. So in 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 assessing this application, which is which has resulted in delays due to um, additional information needs to be required on flood risk assessment grounds, transport grounds, and also. Ecology grounds. Um, officers consider that the proposal is is acceptable, subject to the conditions stated. And the previous concerns have been addressed, uh, particularly in respect of transport, flood risk assessment, and as well as ecology. And that's the reason stated in the report. Are you complete, Andrew? Yeah, just oh, just um, 
because the next one goes on to the community council side. So yeah, the conclusion is it's recommended for approval and uh, issues involving flood risk assessment, ecology and roads issues are considered to have been addressed through the submission of additional information. Thank you very much, Andrew. Questions for Andrew. Sitting beside Andrew is Ken Drew, our roads manager, so it might be useful as well if there are questions about the road, if you could pose them to Ken now rather than when we're in session, although it will not stop you asking a supplementary when in session, but if there are roads issues to be addressed, we might as well do it now. So I think I had, did you have a hand up? Ian and then the other Ian, and then Jim McComb. First one, just on the slides in regards to, I suppose, what, what I've never seen and what I've seen visually myself, going, the, the, there's a piece of road which is classed as being private road, which I think that's absolutely the case between Pilfoot Hotel and the site itself or, or the, the public toilets that are there. The visual that I've seen didn't, didn't actually reflect what it looks like to me when I actually seen it. I wonder if we could have another look at that if that was possible. I just uh, no, I understand that is a private road. Uh, it's very contentious. Uh, I mean, just. I mean, the, 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 there's a high level of complaints to all the ward members in that area, but that particular road, the council used to maintain it for various reasons. We stopped maintaining that as the, as we reach more financial constraints. So, I mean, I think that's kind of, doesn't it show just how important that section of the road is and what the uh, potential changes should be made there, uh, Chairman? I think that's the one point, other than that, I mean, I did think you, you mentioned about a private road. I thought it was actually a public road in the, the U91 round the back, I forget exactly what slide it was. Uh, as you go back, keep going. there, there. I thought that was a public road, but you're actually saying that's a private road. Is that the, to me, it's, it looks like U91 to me, but it may well be. But I mean, that's the condition of the road. So you've got two accesses, I think. So one's public and one's almost like a private. And uh, so the, I think it's U91 if you come from Cummer Trees round to uh, the Ruthwell area. And that's, to me, again, that, that road there. Just to understand, is that the public road or the private road? Just for my own, my own sake. Ken, there, is, there are two. Apparently, Ian, uh, uh, the community council have a number of slides that show that condition of the road that far better, so you'll still get to see them. But, Ken, can you just uh, advise members whether or no that is indeed a private The papers say it's in private ownership. Can you just confirm that? Thank you, Chair. The U91 is the road that runs from Cummer trees and ends up at Ruthwell, and that is a public road. The road that the track that Andrew was referring to as private is a track that links the U91 from the north to um, the actual farm. Yeah, so that 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 section is is private. It's a private track. In terms of the there's some peculiarities in in Powerfoot insofar as um, there are a number of sections of road which are part adopted and part not. And I don't try to understand the exact reasons why that is the case. The C34 is the public road that links to the, the main B724. It travels south into Powerfoot and it terminates just beyond Rye Hill Road. It then becomes an unclassified public road as far as the western boundary of the car park of the Powerfoot Hotel. So it's a public road all the way from the B724 to the end of the car park. Beyond that point along the, the coast, it's a private track. And that's the track that the applicant has indicated they have control over. Does, does that answer your question? No, it, it does. It, but I suppose it was, if we're getting more photographs and the gas tap from community council, that probably answers it better, Chairman, as, you, as you're saying. But just for, for clarity, I mean, the council did used to maintain that up until just a short number of years ago, and it was a, a fairly good road. It's used a lot by the public. That's a viewpoint as well as the public toilets being there. So, But again, that will come up through the when we're in session. Thanks, Ian. Ian Blake. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Andrew, if I could ask you to go back to you, number one slide taken from Powfoot Golf Course to the proposed site. And I appreciate this is probably just an indicative layout of the caravans, but I'd like to know how far the caravans are proposed to be from the actual golf course. Andrew? I can probably go back to the, to the layout slide, actually. So that viewpoint was probably taken. So that's the, the, the northeastern boundary, the proposed extension which is all this area here 
that viewpoint is probably taken roughly about about there. So actually, the golf course will be here. So the proposed layout is actually being built up to the boundary. That's that's my understanding. Looking at that plan, and then also looking at so if you think there. So yeah, so that's the boundary there, and then this is the golf course here. So it's it's pretty much built up to the boundary. So, yeah. so you couldn't actually quantify the distance from the the chalets there to the actual to the fairway on the golf course. I, I don't have that measurement to hand. That's that's just the viewpoint. It doesn't state what how far away it is on the visuals that have been submitted in the LVIA. Uh, Jim, Jim McComb. Thanks, Chair. On pages 32 and 33, there is reference to a traffic survey conducted in 2016. Can you tell me, Andrew, who actually conducted the traffic survey? Andrew? The, when the, the application was originally submitted in May, 20, April, May 2016, the supporting information, the transport assessment contained a traffic uh, survey and it was done using something called TRICS data and, and Ken will probably be able to explain more what that is, but effectively TRICS data is, is an estimate. Um, the figures that were found in that survey were, were not, we did not consider that, that they were acceptable really in, in terms of the traffic impact that was being proposed. The applicant then went away and did a traffic survey, which was actually on-site traffic count. And that's the information that's been taken into account in the, in the assessment. So there was two surveys. Effectively, the first one's been superseded by the additional one that was, was then submitted at a later date. Is that adequate, Jim, or would you like Ken to expand on that? Yeah, so I take it from what you've said, Andrew, both surveys were submitted by the applicant? Yes, as, as supporting information, yes. Any other members for either the case officer or Ken at this moment in time? Patsy? Yes, it's, it's Ken. It's just about the bridge, um, which I think you said was listed, Andrew. Um, and I just wonder, there's a lot of traffic going to use it, and I just wonder how that... Is, there, is, there, is it proposed to keep that bridge, or is there a proposal to reinforce it, or how are you going to manage that? Because it's... Ken? <laughs> um, there's no intentions of altering the listed structure. Indeed, I suspect there might be many reasons why it should be retained as it is. Um, that's a separate consideration. The actual bridge itself, as has already been pointed out, is only about three metres wide. Um, so it only permits one vehicle at a time to actually run in through, the, uh, through that section of the village. Um, there's no intention to upgrade it or anything else. Um, there was a proposal for priority traffic control at the bridge that came in as part of the application. Um, that was considered by ourselves and we were reasonably relaxed about that as an approach, um, but uh, we consulted Police Scotland. Police Scotland take a slightly different view insofar as they view a priority system as potentially increasing the speeds on the side which has priority, and thereby it actually may cause more of a road safety um, issue than it would seek to control. So as such, the, the bridge is a, a very effective form of traffic calming. It's not ideal at that width because it has been damaged on a couple of occasions in the past. I don't know the full history as to what the damage was caused by. Um, but it's been confirmed by the police last October that there have been no accidents in the last three years at the bridge that have been reported to them. Thanks, Ken. Any other members? In that case, we'll come to the representatives. First, we have a Comer Trees and Comer Trees West Community Council. I have a list here that's Peter Burns, but whoever it is, would you like to come forward, please? Is it Peter? Oh, no, it's not Peter. But yeah, just give your name, please, and you will have this.
You will have five minutes because it's a major application if you want for your presentation. And again, I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go just to bring your presentation to a conclusion. Lovely. And you kindly wait in case members have questions for you before you return to your seat. And just whenever you're ready. What's yes, your name, madam? It's please? Lorraine Bell. But Lorraine Bell. Lorraine Bell. Our main objection is uh, the impact on the roads. In 2005, Story Homes were forced by the Scottish Office to reduce their planning application of 20 homes down to 15 because of the impact on the roads in the village. The road in and out of Powfoot is unsuitable for the works traffic required to prepare the site, the additional 213 static caravans delivered, and the traffic, the volume of traffic once the site is up and running. The bridge to the east of the village is listed and is difficult to negotiate in anything larger than a car. The road from Powfoot Golf Hotel is owned by the applicant and is of very poor standard and I think we've got some pictures here. That's the main road into Powfoot. That is the road between the Golf Hotel and the site entrance. This is a right of access to the car park at the end and it's also a national cycle route. <clears throat> On page 32 of the final report, section 2.4D, it states the private track between the end of the public road and the application site is the ownership of the applicant. Horham and Kinmount sold the road uh, from the Golf Hotel to the entrance site to the applicant. He sold it along with 24 inches of grass verge either side, which is not enough to create the passing bays that they're needing. Um, Hodham and Kinmount were not aware of this application and neither was the immediate neighbour, Mr David Sloan. The Community Council requests that before any planning conclusion is reached, that a site visit can be arranged with the applicant, the case officer and the Community Council. We feel that if planning is granted, the works included in the application will not be carried out by the applicant himself, but this site will be sold on to a large consortium where no consideration or empathy will be shown to Paufu and its residents. And that's it. Thank you, Lorraine. Any members have any questions for Lorraine? Patsy? Just for um, clarity, um, Mrs. Bell, um, all those pictures that you've shown us, a very bit clearer on, on the slide behind you, that's all in private ownership? Yes. That starts from Powfoot Golf Hotel to the entrance into the caravan site that Hodham and Kenmount say has been sold to the applicant. Ian. I'll just be very brief, Chair. But I mean, thanks for the for the the community council's input and thanks for the photographs as well. That much much better reflects what's actually going on there and the condition of that road. We used to maintain that road from there. It's about I don't know, maybe a couple hundred metres or something like that, maybe two hundred and fifty. Uh, it used to be up to what you what would class as an adoptable standard. It was a fairly good road, but let's say for because of the financial constraints, council being over over the last number of years we've changed our policy in regards to that particular piece but we do have public toilets that the council own at the end of that uh, so I mean I just think that much far better reflects uh, and that is Powerfoot Golf Hotel's car park on the right hand side maybe probably most of the people have actually been there uh, on reflection uh, that's set in the committee but it does it's, it's much better and it shows the extremities that people have to cope with down in that area Thanks Ian I take that just a statement uh, rather than a question I, I uh, Okay, so if uh, we are finished with Lorraine, we now have Councillor Richard Brodie. Councillor, Ru Councillor Brodie, you'll know the, the procedure, I'm sure, that uh, you make a presentation, then you have to leave the chamber, you're no entitled to remain. And you again have up to five minutes, and I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go, just to draw your presentation to a conclusion. And again, Councillor Brodie, whenever you're ready. 
Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I would like to support the submission by the local community council, and I note the their comments, especially about the private private road up to up to the caravan park. There's a lot of local concern about the impact of the proposal on the village of Powfoot and the capacity of the road infrastructure to cope with increased traffic. Uh, these concerns were highlighted by the council's road officer in 2016. Uh, and he also highlighted the restricted local road network. As already said, the entrance to Power Foot Village is a single track bridge on a bend. And when I go there in my Nissan Micra, I find it very difficult. You've got to concentrate to negotiate it, and it must be very much more difficult for larger vehicles to, to do that. Uh, since 2016, I don't think anything has really changed. Uh, although there's lack of full clarity in the number of extra vehicles which will be generated by the scheme. The report does categorically include that there will be a significant impact on, on traffic flow. Uh, there will also be a cumulative effect in summer. Uh, I think to maximise the potential of the static caravans in June and July, uh, in July and August, the, uh, there will be work into a large cocoa capacity. And it, and Puff, it's a bit like Southern Ness or Sandy Hills in the West, where, where whenever there's a peep of sunshine, scores of people load up their cars with their children and their, their dogs and descend in Puff. So it's, it is a busy place during this, the summer already. Uh, the fact that the road infrastructure is still very limited is still exist. Uh, and there have been no proposals to mitigate the bridge which have been put forward to the report today. There was one proposal to introduce a priority arrangement at the bridge that has been dismissed by the police as dangerous, and we, that was mentioned earlier in, in, the, in the proceedings. But I think we need to probably look at that, and, because this arrangement of traffic lights does, does operate elsewhere in Scotland. And perhaps we should be looking at measures to widen the bridge, because... As I said, the increased traffic, there have been a number of accidents at the bridge before, it's been damaged, and that causes problems because all the, all the other roads in Powerfoot are basically private, and, we, and it will cause problems if there's more damage to the bridge. So I think we should look at that. So the question, obviously, for members is whether this, the significant impact of the traffic flow uh, is justified by the economic, economic benefit. So uh, my request is is that the, that the committee agree to the council, committee council invitation to a site visit where the issues can be seen in context. And I would like members and officials to focus on what can be done to address issues arising from the restricted road network. Thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. Does anyone have any questions for Councillor Brodie? In that case, thank you for your presentation, Councillor Brodie. We now, oh, I'll wait till Richard leaves. We have Kim Tullett, the agent, next. And Kim, you will again be afforded five minutes and with 30 seconds to go, we'll remind you just to draw your presentation to a conclusion. And just whenever you're ready, gentlemen. Good morning. Queensbury Bay has been an established holiday destination for approaching 50 years. It's been evident in the previous application how important tourism is to Dumfries and Galloway. Once the development is complete, based on British Holiday Homes and Park Association and Visit Wales data from 2011, each of the 315 static units ought to contribute £15,300 per annum into the locality, with the touring units generating £2,800. The cumulative effect of a revitalised Queen Queensbury Bay therefore to be, ought to be an economic boost in, into the Annandale area of £4.93 million per annum. Queensbury Bay is located about a kilometre west of Powell Foot, separated by the expanse of the golf course, which is likely to remain in situ and keep the two identities separate. Access to the site is from the east along public roads 
and a short section of private road under the applicant's control. Traditionally, Dumfries and Galloway always used to maintain the road all the way down to the beach car park. We've had a period of about three years where they promised to come and improve the road, but funds are never there. Queensbury Bay is privately owned by the applicant's family, who are about to start their 17th season. There is no reason why they won't be starting their 18th season or their 19th season. The applicant's son is in the audience. He wants to know what his future is. Queensbury Bay is of its nature a quiet site, as was borne out by the traffic survey. It achieved less than 60% of what national data would indicate it should achieve. It has been in its existing format of 102 statics and 117 tourers for nearly 40 years. The site now requires substantial investment of about two million pounds to upgrade it to meet contemporary visitor expectations and safeguard its sustainability. That investment will include standing in the council's place and improving the access road. Investment also needs to include a quarter of a million pound modern standards UV sewage treatment plant, which will improve the environment, particularly the cockle beds on the Solway estuary. This privately funded expenditure requires to be spread over a number of years with new additional pitches stances that will uh, generate additional site fees to service private bank loans. The expansion of sites as such as Queen Bisbury Bay, is supported with an adopted Dumfries and Galloway policy, but caveated with subject to the subject twos. The subject twos in this case related to exhaustive substantiations on ecological issues to Scottish natural heritage, flood and waste discharge standards to the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, and on vehicles to Dumgal highways. The planning application process has made us aware of the issues on Pow, to Powerfoot residents, particularly in respect to Pow Bridge, which we have addressed to the satisfaction of Dumfries and Galloway professional officers. The output of these studies and regulatory responses has culminated in a committee report recommending that you approve the application subject to conditions. If the application is improved, the upgrade works are envisaged to starting time for next season be phased over five to seven years with the improved sewage treatment plant and improvements to the roads given the priority. Please vote to approve the planning application as per the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions for the agent? Katie? Thank you, Chair. Um, my question really is to you in regards to the road and you mentioned there in your presentation that the applicant is in control of the road and owns the road. And can I ask, my question really is, why have you not brought the site up to standard and the road up to standard before you look at, before you look at expanding and actually consolidate the, the things that you have? And on the same respect, in terms of the sewage plan, why would you not get what you've got up to standard before looking to expand, rather than expanding on, on aspects that are needed? updated. Thank you. In respect to the sewage treatment plant, it can't be upgraded to the standards that SEPA would ask for. Um, it's lost to a standard of about 40 years ago, um, which doesn't involve things such as UV treatment. It doesn't involve being a packaged sewage treatment plant that discharges potable water. Because it's an existing facility, and there are so many facilities like it um, throughout Scotland, it's disproportionate for SEPA to take um, enforcement action against what's already there. They can only help us to improve ourselves if further development is granted. In respect to the road, I've been involved with Queensbury Bay now for coming up four years. At the start of every season, Dumfries and Galloway have promised to redress the surface of the road. We've always waited for that to happen. The site is not particularly large. It doesn't charge particularly high site fees. 
probably looking at an investment of a quarter of a million pound to go all the way through and sort out the road with a very durable surface. And that money currently isn't available. I would just add, if that's no. all right, um, I think the, the level of investment that's required in, in the road and the treatment works um, is, is on the back of additional pitches and additional um, static um, occupation. So the additional income that the application will bring in will fund the, the infrastructure upgrade. At this point, as Kim's mentioned, um, that's not, not available. I was wanting to speak, but before that, Ken, can you confirm who owns that road? Or in our opinion, who owns that road? The, the road is in the ownership of Queensbury Bay Caravan Park. Your name's no Kim, oh, it's it, 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 Ken, sir. Is it? Uh, Ken I was speaking to. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not sure about um, the history to this road um, and why it seems to have been maintained for a certain number of years and then stopped. It is in the list of public, it is not a, a, a road that's listed in the list of public roads, therefore it is not adopted by Dumfries and Galloway Council and there hasn't been a budget for the council to spend money on private roads um, for about 25 years. At that point in time there was occasionally grant grants that could be provided for, for working on private roads. That hasn't existed for a very, very long time. As a private road, we wouldn't carry out works on it unless somebody was funding those works, um, either another council department or the individual who owns it. In terms of ownership, the land ownership of the Solom of the road doesn't really come into it either, in, insofar as public roads are not owned by the council. The Solom of public roads is always owned or generally owned by the third party landowners. Um, that's something that most people don't realise. But the only land that the council as roads authority own is where we've purchased land to carry out an improvement. That's not the case down here. This is a road that's not in the list of public roads and as such is private. Okay, well, I hope that's solved at that. Ian? Thanks. I, just, I suppose a local ward member and all the ward members have been involved in this particular particular scenario. And Ken's <coughs> right, is, but the history behind it is that that section, 250 metre road, is it's owned by whether it's Hodham or whether it's Queensbury Bay Caravan Park. I think it's irrelevant the fact that it's a private road. Council maintained it for a number of years because of the predominantly because of the public toilets. And as a scenic, there's a, there's a visitor area at the end of that, so it was a, it was a grace and favour thing is why they did it. Help tourism, local members were supportive of it. But four or five years ago, that got to the stage because of financial constraints. They just, ultimately, officers were either filling potholes or, or, or uh, uh, maintaining private roads. So, so the, dis again, the decision was made, ultimately, to fill the potholes and stop maintaining private roads. So that's a, a brief history snapshot. But I suppose my question was in regards to some of the language that was used earlier, it's the response, it's get to this point, because I've got a quite clear understand myself in my own mind, but I think for the sake of the committee and the understand, knowing what, what the, the, the applicants understanding is, who's responsible for the maintenance of that piece of road? I think, I mean, hopefully we'll get to a point where we get a site visit, but that's later on. But who's responsible for, for that piece of road? He indicated, I think, they're, they're doing a job in place of the council instead of the council. I'd just like to question uh, through you. Chairman, is that who can just so you can lay out who does he thinks that's responsible for that piece of road? Because if we didn't get bottomed out today, we'd maybe get bottomed out at a later point in time. I thought Ken had said it's not ours, and, and it should be quite simple. If it's not ours, it's not ours. Uh, as it is, the solemn's not ours anyway. But, we, but anyway, but I suppose, Ken, would you I, answer? I suppose, Jim, it was more directed at the at the applicant because it was something that he said within his statement. Was that he's doing council, he's doing in place of council work, or Dumfries and Galloway, I think is what he referred to. We are doing this in place of Dumfries and Galloway council. It's on the back of that statement. It was early on in his presentation. I'd like to understand what he meant by that. For absolute clarity, Ken, is the road ours or is it not? The road is not an adopted road, therefore, it, it's not in the list of public roads, and the roads authority do not main, have any responsibility to maintain it. What there may be some confusion about is whether there is some historic 
access to the car park and toilet area, which there seems to be, uh, that would now perhaps fall under the community's directorate, I'm not sure. Um, I can't honestly comment on what arrangements were there in the past for the grace and favour surfacing or works on a private road, but it's something that as a private road, we've got no responsibility to do anything with now. Thanks, Ken. So I've got Jim, Dougie, and then David. Thanks, Chair. We seem to have established that this is a private road. Mr. Tullin, could you tell me how much of the road verge you own? I can't act answer that because I've never seen the legal paperwork and I wouldn't like to mislead anybody. I think that's a fair statement. I think anyway, any conditions we place, if they can't be met, then the, the development will be allowed to go ahead. And, and we have said in the document, I think there's one condition that passing places have to be put in place if we agree this at whatever stage. Dougie, and then David. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, th I think we've established the, the ownership of the road, but Mr Tullett has, has mentioned that for several years, Dumfries and Galloway Council has been promising that it would resurface the road. I wonder if Mr Tullett could tell us who's actually been making that promise to you? I've only heard that information from the applicant. I've learned something new today that it was grace and favour but the budget seems to have run out in which case we would understand why nobody comes and that we would have to intervene and do it ourselves. I think that's a very helpful statement but I think as well we need to be careful we don't stray into the, base, the, the discussion about who said what. We just need to establish what the situation is to again then we'll, we'll move on. Yeah, I accept that, but I think in fairness to Mr Tullett, um, if somebody has been telling him that the, the road will get resurfaced, um, I, th I think the committee should know. David. Um, may I ask the applicant or the agent at least, um, the uh, road um, renewal and the um, sewage improvement, is that going to happen uh, in the first phase right from the get-go or um, is that going to be phased in as the site grows? There is an undertaking to SEPA that no more load will be put onto the existing treatment plant without it being replaced. So it's a, in terms of the sewage treatment plant, it's a first job that has to be done. Um, we agreed, it would be three summers ago, that there would be no more development that might put load onto the sewage treatment plant. Um, I've driven down the road to Queensbury Bay this morning to pick up John and his son. It, it is not good. It's probably bad. Um, new people are not going to be attracted to come to Queensbury Bay unless there is a decent road down to it. So again, it would be one of the first jobs. Can, can I just add also that um, it's subject to one of the conditions is to provide the, the detail and agree with the council of the, the passing place an upgrade that is required on that road. Aye, yeah. Does anyone have any further questions for the agent? In that case, would you gentlemen like to take your, take your seats? Thank you very much. Members are now in session. Ian? Chairman, I mean, hope... I hope that, we, that, that the committee does see this as being a, a site that's because it, it's it's a vast change to say the least uh, within that local community. What, what's being uh, put forward? I mean, this committee has always looked favourable, but I think towards uh, large sites that uh, help the, the local economy, so on and so forth. But it's been outlined by many people the potential impact to the local community, whether it's roads. Uh, whether it's on local services or, or whether it's just on the, the local amenity in that area. Particular problems around about the road, are, for by we've got the actual extra visual slides, I think to have a site visit is absolutely essential in this case, Chairman. Uh, and I would ask that we, we, we have a site visit in this case to, in order just to take full consideration of the points 
that have been uh, brought up in front of us today. I think it's essential, Chairman. We'll need to establish what the site visit is specifically for, Ian, but that's if members agree. Is anybody else in favour of a site visit or other an alternative view? Archie? You know, probably because I'm, I'm from that area, Chair, that I've been in there local, so I don't, need a, I don't think we need a site visit. I think the, the, the photograph showed quite clearly what the issues are on that particular thing, so I think we've got enough information to make a decision today. I'm quite happy to move that. Patsy? I would second uh, Councillor Carruthers. I'm not familiar with the area, and it's obviously very complicated, and it's, a, it's going to be a huge change to it's a big increase in number of caravans, and I think we need to go and have a look at it. Okay. Jim McComb. Thanks, Chair. I'm not sure if we actually do have enough information, particularly with regard to ownership of the road verge. I think that is essential that that be established. I'll, I'll, I'll ask Ken, because remember the conditions placed on the approval, if it's ever given, would be to put in place passing places. If the applicant can do that, then the application falls anyway. Ken, can you just confirm that that's right? Or, or, because you've already said you don't know about this. Thank you, Chair. In, in terms of the condition, there is a condition that we've asked for that additional passing places um, be provided on the private track. If the passing places can't be provided because they don't have control of the land in order to do that, then I think it would be probably for the planners to advise them, but my own understanding is that it wouldn't be competent. Andrew, would you like to just add on to that? Before, yes, Chair, before um, recommending this condition, we sought uh, advice from the, um, we asked for clarification from the applicant's agent whether they had control of the land to be able to implement that condition, and they said that they did, hence why the condition was recommended to be attached because the correspondence we received confirmed that they had the necessary control over the land to do that condition. The wording of that condition has been, has been carefully worded that um, the development can't be brought into use unless firstly a scheme of passing places is submitted to the council, but also importantly that it can't actually be implemented unless it's been uh, the, the scheme of passing places has actually been implemented. So if it was to turn out that the the applicant doesn't have the necessary control over um, the land to undertake it, they wouldn't actually be able to implement their planning permission with the way that the condition has been worded, in my opinion. Uh, do you, Jim? Okay. You, you, now, we have a proposal for a site visit and a seconder that's <coughs> in place. We have a proposal that we deal with this today. Currently, that doesn't have a seconder. If that doesn't have a seconder, then we have a site visit. It would be helpful to know what we expect to gain from the site visit, and also for the benefit of the young lady that spoke to us, a site visit doesn't give the community council the opportunity to discuss with the planning committee. We simply go, assess the, the, the area, whatever it is we need to look at in conjunction with staff and your cordially invited to attend, but it's not for a discussion or a meeting. It's to allow the planning members or this committee or the members of the planning committee to view the location firsthand and better understand what the issues are. So I wouldn't want you to be misled into thinking there's an opportunity for a conversation because really that, that shouldn't happen. Ian? Through you, Chair, first I'd like to thank the committee for allowing a site visit in the first place. I think it is very important, like I said, for myself, uh, maybe other members can pick up on their parts, but I think because of the size and scale of this application, I think we have to look at a, a number of issues. One is the impact, potential, we'll see visually, the potential impact that this, the, the extra traffic movements and such like would have on not just the roads infrastructure, so we need to be looking at the roads, uh, the access, going right back to Arthur, actually, I think to, to the low road, I forget the exact number, to B724 maybe I referred to earlier, but right to the low road, so you're, when you come off the, the Annan to Colin Road, but the junction there, through to the bridge, the constraints there, right up through to this private road between Palfoot Hotel, leading up to the, car, uh, the park and the park itself. Uh, and 
when you see the size of the community, I think the potential impact, uh, whether it's road traffic movements, whether it's uh, it's actual how that whole community setting will change, uh, I think we need to be taking consideration of, of, of them. Uh, for, for me, I understand when it comes to the, the infrastructure regarding wastewater and such like, I don't think I've got an issue with that. It's predominantly round about how the impact that'll have uh, on that local community, all, all aspects. Chairman, so for me, I'd like to see that society itself, and in particular, the road leading between, I think it's the B724, but certainly the low road between uh, uh, the Annan Road right up right up to the caravan park itself. And if there's one point, if we really could get clarified, it's a point that Jim uh, Councilor McComb came up with, because it's a condition, conditions have to be competent. Now, to put that into context, if it's only control of 24 inches, which is 600 millimetres each side of the, the road, then a pass in place would go way beyond that level. So they need, at least need, uh, if, if it was to be, the condition was to be competent in regards to that, uh, we need to understand if they have control over that land in which to construct those particular pass in places. So that's the, that's generally my point. Remember, Andrew has information that the applicant has control. That's all we need to know. That doesn't happen then. That's no, that's no real issue. We don't deal, that's a civil matter. I've got Ian Blake and then I've got Andy. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the, the, the concerns about the road issues and, and other, uh, about the scale of the development. Uh, I would also like to be included the proximity of the development to the golf course. Uh, there are certainly, there's at least one other area on the golf course that's protected by a high net because of walls that have gone astray. Uh, and I'm fairly certain I have, I've been in that field myself in, in recent years, in quite a few years ago. I would like that to be included. We could, we could certainly look at that and we would probably be able to put that as a condition, but we haven't even agreed the thing yet. We're only going to look at the location. But are you right, that's Andrew and David will have a note of that. Andy and then Dougie. Um, if Arsys was a, um, a, a proposal, I'm happy to second that we have enough information today. Say this again, Andy. If Ars is saying we've got enough to, to, to decide today, right, and that she's moving that, I'm happy to sign that. You're too late, we've agreed on the site visit. No, we didn't. Eh? No, we didn't. Nope. No, we didn't. Nope. No, absolutely didn't. No, we're no. Nick, you're, you, yes, it's your baby. I thought no one had been willing to second that, because I did ask twice. I asked twice. I just I mean, I'll find out that's not safe, is it? No. Nick, are we still in session and can that proposal still be made? I don't believe that a final decision was made on a site visit, Chair. It was um, proposed. Um, the, the, the amendment from Councillor Driver wasn't sec seconded at that point, but as the discussions develop, someone has come forward to second it before a final decision was taken. Okay, in that case it's competent that Andy can second that choose and we now have a vote. Ian? I just, on that point, I mean, you came in and said, right, okay, as we go forward, why, we need to be absolutely clear why we're having a site visit. That was a clear indication that we're having a site visit as far as I'm concerned. I think it's incompetent. It will not happen back. because we've got governance advice that says that that's competent, therefore competent it is, and we're going to go to a vote. We now have a vote, a motion by Ian, seconded by... Now the legality is sitting here beside me. Who seconded your proposal? You, Ivor? No, oh, but can we hear the recording to actually hear what was said when you actually said, well... There's nobody seconding the uh, amendment, therefore we're having a site visit. What are the reasons? That's what was said. I think we should hear the recording to clear this up and doesn't put anybody at any ill matter then. You, That's you, what was said. You don't need to because Nick said, as the discussion developed, another member said, I now want to second what Archie's proposed. And I'm taking professional advice that that proposal is competent. I respect what the recording said. I'll ask you to repeat yourself, Nick. And, and I know that's what I said. As no one is second in Archie, we are, attend we are taking a site visit. I said that.
I think my my advice, Chair, is that as as you've just summarised, the um, Councillor Crothers and Councillor Gilroy put forward a, mo um, a motion to propose a site visit. Um, Councillor Driver had indicated um, previously that he felt that there was sufficient information um, to enable the committee to reach a decision today. Um, the conversation went on. You did in you did um, sort of refer to the as it appeared at that point, the emerging view in favour of a site visit. Subsequently, Councillor Ferguson um, indicated he wished to support um, or second Councillor Driver's amendment in that um, he put forward that he believes that there's sufficient information to for the committee to um, determine it today. Um, it is a it is a critical point at which a decision is taken, and and there may be differing views as to when a decision is taken. But my view on here in the discussion is that there was a discussion going on around um, reaching a decision one way or another, but a final decision had not had not been arrived at. Okay, in that case, no, we're not having a discussion. Point of order, Chair. Once a decision has been made, you said the decision had been made because there was no seconder, therefore it falls. That would suggest that under standing orders of this council, we cannot revisit that for six months unless there is a 48-hour recall. That hasn't happened. Therefore, the decision should stand. The discussion continued beyond that, though, was the problem. Therefore, the debate was still ongoing. That's the issue. We didn't stop there and going to the next agenda item, we had a discussion and several members chose to speak. And at that stage, Councillor Ferguson has indicated he wants to support Councillor Driver. So we're not having a debate about this today. But Chairman, you asked what the points in particular why, what we wanted to see in the site visit. That's right. So this, the decision was made. And I think, it's, as you right now, this is open to legal challenge the way we're going on. You will recall I was asking clarification as to why, and it was that point, Councillor Ferguson was obviously intent that the points you were raising, he, he was satisfied with. So we'll go to a vote. Um, thank you, Chair. Then just to clarify, the motion being proposed by Councillor Crothers and seconded by Councillor Gilroy, um, that there be a site visit. Um, the amendment proposed by Councillor Driver and seconded by Councillor Ferguson um, that the matter be determined today. Councillor Dempster. Amendment. Councillor Campbell. Motion. Councillor Blake. Motion. Councillor Campbell. Doogie Campbell. Amendment. Councillor Carruthers. Motion. Councillor Driver. Amendment. Councillor Ferguson. Amendment. Councillor Gilroy. Councillor Juicy. Councillor Hagman. Amendment. Councillor Hislop. Councillor James. Councillor Lever. Motion. Councillor Maitland. Motion. Councillor Martin. Motion. Councillor McComb. Motion. Councillor McKee. Motion. Councillor Murray. Motion. And Councillor Young. So we have 14 members voting in favour of the motion and five in favour of the amendment. Therefore, the motion is carried, the decision being there will be a site visit. Do members want Ken present as the roads manager at that site visit? Yeah. That will save us going back and forth on more than one occasion. So Ken will be invited to attend, thanks Ken, 
and uh, David will notify us when the, the site visit will take place. Thanks, members. We come to agenda item number six, erection of agricultural building at Craigley Farm, Gelston, Castle Douglas. It's a full application. The recommendation is to approve unconditionally. The reference number is 17 stroke 2063 stroke full. And the case officer is Claire Cat. Oh, no, it's no. Well, it's Claire Cat, but uh, Je Jessica. 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 Jessica, take us through your presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is an application for the erection of an agricultural building um, as part of an existing farm complex to the southwest of Gelston. Um, it's, uh, it's proposed to the rear of um, an existing farm which comprises of the farmhouse and a mixture of traditional and modern buildings. So the proposed building will measure approximately 46 metres in width by 54 metres in length and the height at its maximum point is approximately 12 metres. Uh, it'll be, the walls are proposed to be constructed of um, fire, uh, the June upper green under a grey fibre cement roof. Just take you through some photographs. So this is actually standing on the site, um, looking from the west. And again, another view, so we're actually, you can see the rear of the existing buildings. Again, just to give you the character of what the area is now. And then we're moving to the north. Another view. And there is a difference in um, ground levels. You can see just behind those trailers, the difference between the, the uh, existing shed and the site of the proposed. So this is a view looking south. So we're going from the village, um, out of the village, looking towards the farm. Um, the proposed shed is to the left-hand side of the trees. And again, this is looking from the public road, looking northeast. And again, looking northeast, so the proposed um, building will be located behind the existing. Uh, the application is recommended for approval without any conditions. Thank you, Jessica. Does any member have any questions for the case officer? Okay. Thanks, Chair. Um, page 60, uh, massing and scale. You make reference to the, the proposed building being quite large. Um, the question that comes to mind is, well, what's too large um, in terms of the size of the building and the impact that it has? Where, where does this fit in terms of other sheds of a, a similar um, design and use in, in terms of that size? Jessica? I think we have got examples of um, approving sheds of, of this size um, previously. Um, actually on this site we approved, um, I'll just move back, the shed on the right hand side is of a just slightly smaller <laughs> footprint which was approved in 2016. Um, so it, in the context of this site um, and the other large buildings that are already there, the backdrop of the topography of the land and the fact that it has um, different land levels is considered um, acceptable in this location. Thanks, Jessica. Any other questions for the case officer? In that case, there are no speakers. Member, we're in session. Hey, Archie. Go with the recommendations, Chair. Are there any alternative views? Thanks very much, Jessica. Short and sweet. <coughs> hey, Nick, can you confirm the recommend uh, decision, please? And the decision is to approve unconditionally as per the report, Chair. Thanks, Nick. Agenda item seven has been uh, withdrawn. Uh, coming to agenda item number eight. Consultation regarding an application made under section 36 of the Electricity Act 1989 for the purpose for the proposed windy standard phase three wind farm comprising of erection of 20 wind turbines, 825 metres height and 12 maximum tip height of 177.5 metres, two permanent anemometer masts 
four borrow pits and associated infrastructure. Pack proposed windy standard three, Carsfern Forest, Carsfern. The application type is a section 36 consultation. The recommendation is to raise no objection. Reference number is 16 stroke 1852 stroke S36. And the case officer is Robert Duncan. Robert, you take us through your slides, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I added a viewpoint to the presentation that had previously been prepared, hence the reason why I was uploading the new one there. Uh, but we'll revert to the previous presentation after this item. Uh, clearly what you have in front of you is an application made under Section 36 of the Electricity Act. So in other words, this is a determination that is made by the Scottish Government and the Council in this case are acting as a statutory consultee. Uh, the implications of that are quite obvious. We've seen these kind of proposals before. If the Council are minded to formally object to this proposal, then it would trigger a public local inquiry at which the Council would participate. Moving on, the location plan, just th this has been taken from our own mapping system. So it shows very broadly the turbine locations. You can see the amber stars that have been outlined in red. The red line is not in this case, the application site boundary, it's just to itemise where it is. When you're looking up to get your bearings and the background to the cumulative is at 1.1 of the report, you're looking at proposals there at Ben Black, which was granted after PLI, proposals at South Kyle, which straddles the boundary with East Ayrshire, which was also granted uh, following a PLI. You have the Windy Standard 2 turbines located right to the east of the proposal. The original Windy Standard 1, which dates back to the mid-90s. Beyond that, you have the Afton Reservoir proposal in green, consented but not implemented, as we will see. Beneath that, you have the Windy Rig proposal, which went to committee recently and you are minded to approve. To the south, the red dots indicate something that's been refused or withdrawn. In this case, that is the Quantum Section 36 proposal, which has been withdrawn. As you move again to the east, you have the Longburn proposal, which you know all about. That's presently at appeal. Uh, we're awaiting a decision on that. And then further to the west, you have um, Weather Hill, the original proposal in the green, and the proposed additions in the amber stars. Returning pretty much due east, you've got the log proposal at the moment, which has since been amended to take away the six there. And then as you're moving across to Sanka, you have the Gookin Rig Community Wind Power Scheme, Whiteside Hill, uh, and really side as well. So that gives the kind of cumulative context, if you like. Um, we'll, we'll come on to this in the visualisations, but this proposal is basically for 20 turbines in two broad clusters. So you've got a cluster um, in the southern part, uh, 20 turbines in total, 12 of these are up to 177.5 metres um, base to tip and the remainder 125 metres base to tip. <coughs> the, the site layout, this is it as proposed. Um, again, you're looking at this part of the application site, the southern part, sorry, the eight turbines here in blue, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, being the 125 metre base to tip element. The northern element here which you can see are the 12 larger turbines, 177.5 metres base to tip. Um, this relates to the proposal I described at 1.5 of the report. Uh, you'll notice the access tracks on the site, the adjacent Windy Standard 2 and Windy Standard 1 developments as well. Elsewhere you have proposed borrow pit locations in the brown. The permanent anemometer masts that are proposed at the blue triangle there and the blue triangle further down too and we'll come on to that. This is a representation of the proposed 125 metre base to tip turbine, a fairly standard type, three blades, horizontal axis, with the transformer you'll note at the base of the turbine. Moving on, you have a similarly proportioned turbine, but this one is obviously a lot larger. It's 177.5 metres from base to tip. Uh, with a hub height of 121 metres above ground level. Again, the transformer is next to the turbine base. 
Moving on, you've got a typical turbine foundation, so that gives a cross-sectional view of the concrete that's involved, which would be reinforced. And moving on, the transformer in greater detail, a fairly innocuous cabinet-type structure at the base of each turbine. And this is the proposed construction compound. It would measure, indicated here, 100 metres by 100 metres along each edge, so given a total area of 10,000 square metres, or a hectare. Um, you would be looking at, I mean, the cross-section shows it here, you're looking at security fencing 2.5 metres in height, bounding that area. Returning to, to the anemometer mast, uh, there are two proposed anemometer masts in the site that would be permanent. This is one, you can see it's a lattice structure, so no guy wires to this. 85, eight, sorry, 84 metres from base to tip. And the next one, similar type of structure, but 121 metres from base to tip. Within the site, this just gives you a representation of the typical access track detail, so showing how that would be formed and how overburden would be stored in each side and how it would drain and so on and so forth. There's also a batch plant for producing concrete within the site, so these provide the details of that as well. Turning now to the visualisations, this is figure 6.31a uh, of volume 3 of the submitted environmental statement. All of the images you will see are from the LVIA that's been submitted to us. So this one, this viewpoint is the single sensitive viewpoint within Dumfries and Galloway. And this is looking from the summit of Cairnsmoor of Castfern north towards Ayrshire and the central belt. Uh, you can see the proposed turbines in red from this viewpoint. The photograph above simply gives the existing position. So you've obviously got a lot of consented development within this area that hasn't yet been implemented and that's shown in blue. The next viewpoint provides greater clarity on this issue. Again, the proposed turbines are in red. On the left-hand side, in the blue detailing, you have Ben Brack, which I mentioned earlier, and then you have across the blue band here, so the blue band of closer turbines represents the South Kyle decision that can now be implemented. As you're moving across here, you're looking at Afton Reservoir. The green for the avoidance of doubt just represents Windy Standard 2 and Windy Standard 1. So what you're obviously seeing here is quite the spread of cumulative development, you know, both implemented but mainly consented but as yet undeveloped schemes and these are of differing heights and dimensions as well. This probably demonstrates the point I'm making there. The photo montage shows the existing context of development. You have the proposal obviously superimposed on a photograph of how it looks at the moment. Because a lot of these are unimplemented, you can see the key difference there. And I would also point out that zoomed in slightly from the previous viewpoint. Next viewpoint is viewpoint two from Nockengorich which is to the south of the site at quite some distance. This has been assessed as having significant adverse visual effects upon it, um, experienced at this location as a result of the proposed wind farm. So what you're looking at, slightly obscured by trees, obviously, in this viewpoint, because the Y-lines are bare earth analysis, you've got the proposed windy standard turbines in red on the right-hand side. And that's a closer Y-line viewpoint, so in theory, you're looking over the hill and seeing this. I would point out, obviously, you have existing tree plantation that's maybe hidden behind the foreground, but there is existing tree plantation there, so that would soften the impact slightly. I and mean, again, this is a bit of analysis, but you will experience a view similar to that from Nockengorik, and that is considered to be significant. Looking at the other viewpoints, viewpoint six, Carrihon Mine Core Path. This is near Karsh Fair, and it's just to the west of Karsh Fair, and this is looking towards Ben Brack. You'll see on the lower wire line that relates to the photo, you can see the Windy Standard 3 proposal just appearing over that ridge line. On the left hand side here, you have the Ben Brack proposal, which has been unimplemented so far, having received consent previously. And that's a photo montage. It's a bit 
It's a bit unclear, but you can maybe see the visualizations of the photomontage, rather, of the turbines on the horizon area there. Next viewpoint is from Black Craig Hill. I should point out this is Black Craig to the northeast of the site near Afton Reservoir, not the one near Corsic, uh, just so that's clear. So this is looking to the southwest. It's a viewpoint from within East Ayrshire. So you can see at the moment, you can see existing windy standard one and two. So it's quite a long distance view. What you have in the foreground here, you can see the proposed development in red. So if you like, it's set within quite a widespread cumulative impact at the moment. And you have the various names of the proposals up above. I, I won't go into them all at this stage. Uh, again, this is a viewpoint from within East Ayrshire. Returning to, sorry, that's the photo montage. It just shows it in the, in the context of the existing scheme. The closest one being Wendy Standard 1. So you've got turbines of quite a different scale there. Viewpoint 8 is from the Karshfern Heritage Trail. This is looking towards Cairnsmore of Karshfern, quite obviously. On the right-hand side in the blue, you have the Quantins proposal, which was withdrawn some time ago, so I would suggest you discard that from consideration. The proposal would appear as shown in red. And then you have the Ben Brack and South Kyle proposal shown in blue, so they've been consented but not implemented yet. This is moving slightly round to the right-hand side. So this is showing the location of the Long Barn proposal at that location there. And further away, you've got the Weather Hill development as built and the proposal to extend that shown there too. Visualisation, again, it's maybe not clear, but you're seeing some visibility of turbines over that ridge line there. Next viewpoint, this is on the A713. It's the southern approach to Karshfern, so probably at a distance of about a mile from Karshfern itself. It's looking north. You can see the prominence here of Cairnsmore of Karshfern on the right-hand side. Again, the blue turbine showing the Quantins proposal, which has been withdrawn. So what you're seeing from this viewpoint is obviously, I think, you can maybe get a blade tip or two. Um, the proposed band of visual influence is there. So in essence, very limited impact here. Viewpoint 10, Loch Doom. This is taken from within East Ayrshire. Um, you're looking pretty much due east here towards the development. So from left to right, you're going to see the impact of South Kyle, Ben Brack. You've then got the proposed Windy Standard 3 in red, and obviously more prominent as you're moving to the right-hand side, the Arkens, more of Cash Fern. And finally to the right, you've got the Windy Rig, again, um, permitted by committee, but as yet undeveloped on the right-hand side. So in terms of photo montage, you can see the proposed turbines there for Windy Standard 3 up on the horizon. Uh, the others haven't been modelled because obviously they're as yet undeveloped and don't show up in this photo montage. The next viewpoint is Ben Brack. Con confusingly, this isn't the same viewpoint as the previous scheme that I've mentioned. Uh, this is a different location. It's a view from the southeast. So, again, you're seeing, looking at this one, the Windy Standard development in red. So this is looking Cairns more of Cast Fair on the left-hand side. You have Windy Red in blue in the foreground from this particular viewpoint. So glimpse views, if you like, behind that development, as far as this one's concerned. And that gives you a photo montage of the same view. It's, it's basically showing very limited visual impact. It's also showing the scale of the landscape you have here as well. The rolling nature of the hills, the quite distinct topography that's considered to be quite important. The other viewpoint, this is again, it's just, it's from A762, which is the branch off as you go to Glen Lee when you're traveling north, just from New Galloway, so just beyond the churchyard. And this is looking at showing a distant view of Cairnsmore of Karshfair, and it's really quite a landmark hill all the way down uh, the, the, the Ken D Valley until you get to the bypass at Castle Douglas. Um, it's on the skyline, and what you're seeing here is again possibly one or two tips visible theoretically 
behind that part of the ridgeline, but in essence very limited visual impact and it's retaining its key role as a landscape feature. So bringing the key points together in reference to the report, in terms of policy, the report picks up at 4.18 A, B and C. The considerations, the key considerations are set out in your LDP. So that's policy IN2 of the LDP. And in particular, I've itemised three points. The extent to which the proposal addresses the guidance contained within the Dumfries and Gallery Wind Farm Landscape Capacity Study, the DGWLCS. The extent to which the landscape is capable of accommodating the development without significant detrimental impact on landscape character or visual amenity and that the design and scale of the proposal is appropriate to the scale and character of its setting, respecting the main features of the site and the wider environment, and that it fully addresses the potential for mitigation. So that's the framework in which we look at these proposals as set out in your own policies. Looking at 4.20 in the report, um, it starts looking at the DGWLCS and the role of that. I think it's important to note within that paragraph that it does have stated limitations. So the strategic guidance you find within the DGWLCS does not replace the need for individual landscape and visual impact assessments and or environmental assessments for individual wind energy developments. In other words, it's not blanket advice universal across the board. You've got to look at it in the context of a proposal and consider to determine each application on its merits. It's still obviously very significant as a direct policy reference to that. Um, what I think is also very significant in that, and I tried to drill into this in relation to the very large turbine type that's proposed here. Okay, you've got 12 of these proposed as part of the wider development. So you're looking now at the top of page 94, the 2016 review of the DGWLCS, so that's the present version, included an assessment of opportunities for repowering wind farms by replacing existing turbines with larger ones. So it was looking at the existing pattern of development within this landscape. It also included an assessment of the new very large typology within the increase in Galloway. And those assessments, in other words, hypothesizing what very large turbines would look in this landscape character type were informed by computer generated visibility mapping and visualizations based on selected operational and consented wind farms and showing replacement with larger turbines. I think that's significant in trying to understand why the very large turbine type is considered unacceptable within this landscape character type, because we'll, we'll come on to this slightly later. But in my view, I think the visualizations don't demonstrate that there is discord or there isn't a scaling issue with the landscape here in this particular case because of the actual attributes of this one. Um, you'll see at 4.24 again, it simply says there's no scope for very large turbines within this landscape character type. The other obviously key issue in looking at the recommendation, I look carefully at the Council Landscape Architect's response and that appears at 2.2. What I think particularly is of relevance is at 2.2e within the report. So it's the part at the top of page 86 where it says reasons for the change recommendation. And you've got three issues beneath there, one, two, and three. I think that is very important. So it's looking at support for very large turbines and recognizing that support should only be forthcoming if the circumstances and particularities of a given scheme are in some respect an exception to this principle. Council Landscape Architect at 2.2e at point one is recognizing the change to the cumulative baseline as the first point. And the landscape architect doesn't judge that the specific addition of Windy Standard 3 in isolation would tip the balance of acceptability when you're looking at it in context, and that's obviously a judgment call. You're then looking at point two of that paragraph, the question of the introduction of these very large turbine types. So 177.5 metres, your DGWLCS seems to be saying that's a non-starter in this landscape character type at face value. But if you drill down into that, is there going to be greater visual confusion or, or not. Um, 
it's quite a moot point, but we'll come on to that. And then you've got point three, which is the influence of mitigation measures that can be taken. So coming to the, the crux of the issues, drawing all of these things together, our policy, the Council of Landscape Architects responds, because it is primarily landscape and visual impact issue in this case. I think there's three real issues, turbine scale, cumulative impact, visual impact, just generally. Turbine scale, again, I would, I'm, I'm drawing down into the landscape architect's comments at 2.2 point E, and the second point there. In terms of my overall conclusion at 4.30, 4.31 and 4.32, it's obviously not a clear-cut case. Uh, I'm trying to look at this and try and advise members of a position which I feel is sustainable and defensible, not only in relation to this case, but going forward for other cases. In terms of the scaling issue, if we look at that as the first one, I think 4.30 is key. And I'm not convinced that you know, I've produced the table, I'm not convinced that you're going to get visual discords because of the differences in the dimensions of the turbine types there. So when you look at that, the differences are really in terms of hub height and tower height, not really rotor diameter or blade length. And I don't think the visualizations that I've looked at and presented today demonstrate there would be visual discordance either. For me, it looks fairly in accordance with the other proposals you have up there, certainly South Kyle and Ben Brack which are its closest neighbours when you look from many of these viewpoints. So I'm reasonably r relaxed about that issue. I don't think there is going to be discordance there. On other grounds, I think when you're looking at the location of the proposed turbines, the very large turbines within the landscape, and you look at the overall above ordinance datum foundation levels of these, I also don't think that you're going to see these prominently above other turbines, so I'm more relaxed about the scaling issue in relation to the host landscape, because I don't honestly think there is going to be a real discernible difference between what you have there. The visual impact, turning to that, there is a single sensitive viewpoint in D and G, which you've seen. That's viewpoint one, the top of Cairns Moor of Carsfair, and that's important. The applicant's only of VIA identifies five viewpoints that would be subject to significant effects, and we've seen all of those viewpoints in the presentation today. There is commentary on that within the report. Um, VP2 is really the only one that's assessed as being subject to significant adverse visual effects. So that was the viewpoint from Nokengorak, which you saw. And again, that was softened by forestry impact, both close range and in the longer term. So the conclusion I've drawn at 4.34 is the assessment has highlighted some significant landscape visual and cumulative effects as well as some conflict with the recently adopted Council Landscape Guidance contained within the revised DGWLCS, and that's cross-referenced by LDP Policy IN2, and that forms a component of the adopted supplementary guidance as well, the DG, revised DGWLCS, that is. However, I think on balance, and having looked at this quite carefully, um, I don't think the impacts provide sufficient justification to object to the proposal, and on that basis, it's recommended that the guidance set out, be departed from in this respect. There, there were a few notes I should have mentioned at the start of my presentation, but failed to do so. Um, at 1.10 of the report, it's been pointed out to me there's a typing mistake, and that should say 35 years instead of 25 years. I also now have comments from the Council's Environmental Health Officer, which were missing in the published report. I'm pleased to advise that there are no objections subject to conditions, and these conditions are relatively straightforward standard conditions to try and limit noise, nuisance from arising. Um, so in the event that members went with the recommendation, we would incorporate those within the schedule that we would send to the Scottish Government. The only other point I would say is if it's helpful, I have with me a printout of figure 6.4 of volume 3 of the submitted environmental statement. Now, I appreciate it's going to be open to members' questions soon, but if this helps members identify particular viewpoints in relation to the presentation, I'm quite happy to hand those out with your permission, Chair. I'm just happy to answer any questions arising now. Thanks, Thanks Robert. I've got David McKee, Dougie and Elaine. Well, Chair, the first thing I'd like to say is I've got a great deal of sympathy for the planner that done this presentation. 
How he done that, I just don't know, but he done enough to baffle us with science. Well, I'll take it, it's science. There's 546 turbines, according to what you've given, paper you've given us today, there's 546 turbines in that area. Some, well, some are maybe not developed yet, but in total there's 546. When is enough enough? There's no determine is that. And the, the, I think, comments about DGWLCS, they're talking about, or oh, you're ta taking too wide an area into consideration. You can't just uh, isolate what they're proposing when you're surrounded by, by further wind turbines. And I think uh, it's, we've got to consider the wider area. And that, that's what's uh, baffling me. A landscape architect, I don't know who this guy is at all. If no objections, then it then he comes up with things about the, the impact in the area with the number of turbines and things like that. And there's no objections to it. I'm, I'm absolutely baffled actually. I tend to feel that I'm getting contradictory statements in the, the first part and then the second part. And it's how, how we sort these out, I just don't know. But when as I say, when is enough enough? And you've got cumul cum uh, cumulative uh, capacity in that area. And I just, I just don't know how we can keep going at this. And is there some of these wind farms due to be um, removed because they've been up for 25 years? Is that the question? I don't think they've got to be removed. Well, I have my sympathy for the, the planner, but when's, it, when's enough enough to you? That's the thing, and are, are some of them due to be removed? I'm sure Robert can help you, but as far as I understand, they're nobody ready to be removed. They're none ready to be removed, and the Scottish Government has given indication that we should support extensions or replacement on existing sites, so they might be there for a long, long time. And if Robert's right, this is the first 45-year application we've ever had, but Robert? Thanks, Chair. It's an interesting question. When is enough enough in terms of cumulative development? And that's one of the key issues in this case, as, as I've highlighted. When you're assessing an application, you're obviously looking at policy considerations, the policy of the local authority you're working for. You're looking at a range of other material considerations, um, which is not an exhaustive list. And you're trying to give weight to each of these and weigh them up and draw balance and provide a recommendation over the piece. In this case, when would enough be enough? And looking at the cumulative issue, for, for me, if we had manifest from the visual, visualization, sorry, obvious concerns about the height of these turbines, if they looked like they stuck out, they were completely discordant with other turbines in this location, then I would be concerned, but I don't see that. Um, is it really a departure from the DGWLCS guidance? I don't think so on the basis the methodology in the DGWLCS explains how they modeled that particular issue. I don't think it looked at a scenario like this whereby you did have the very large turbine type, albeit it wasn't necessarily on a ridgeline type pattern as Windy Standard 1 and 2 are. So fundamentally, I think the landscape character here can accommodate these turbines quite happily because you've got that scale in the landscape. The turbines are large, yes, they're the largest ones we've seen, but they're not so large that warrants an objection, in my view. Uh, are there significant adverse visual effects on the water of Duke Valley? Well, you could argue yes, but that's one viewpoint. Um, this is quite significant development. There are obviously a range of positive elements to this proposal as well, and our wind farm policy is broadly supportive in principle to wind farms. It's a case of looking at each one on its merits. Does it have unacceptable cumulative visual and landscape character impacts? Well, in terms of the visualisation you had from the summit of Cairnsmore of Carsfern, I think that Ben Brack and South Kyle are game changers. I think they're game changers in respect of the revised DGWLCS because that was modelled without knowing what the decision was relative to those, and you've got to give weight to those now that are granted but unimplemented schemes. Uh, the other thing as well is, if you look at it, Ben Brack and South Kyle, I mean, I'll quite happily go back to the viewpoint if members want. It might help. You've got a spread of turbine development there. That's probably the best one because it shows you the landscape behind. That one's maybe better, it's slightly broader. You've got Ben Brack on the left-hand side, the kind of cluster, if you like, in the blue, that, that's in the foreground, not the one in the distance. That's a different scheme. I would say that wasn't really affecting this. 
Then to the right hand side of that, you've got the South Kyle proposals. Now, if you take these away, which you can't do because decisions have been made and they're there, you've got to take them into account. You could maybe have an argument that this is then introducing an additional spread of wind turbines towards the west. But you've got that context there. Those decisions have been taken. Those developments can be implemented. So you're then looking at it, you're deciding, OK, in cumulative terms, if you've got the proposal, as you see it read in this diagram in front of you, is this an additional impact? The answer is yes. Is it significant? Possibly. Is it significant and adverse to the effect that you would object to it? And, you know, my view on that is no, because of the context within which it is set now. But at the same time, they are extra turbines. Uh, they are something new for the area. It is additional. But do you then judge the addition of the red turbines into that landscape as reason to object to the proposal or not? The conclusion I've drawn is no. But that's just, that's just my assessment of the case, uh, Chair. But that's very much my thinking on that issue, if that helps. Try not to beat us into submission, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, David also asked about if any being decommissioned, but I don't think that's the case yet, so don't expand on it. Chair, Chair I think yeah. Wendy Standard won in the face of it. I think the 25 year lifespan expires in 2019. Um, but there have been exploratory talks about repowering that proposal. So you might see something new on that site in due course. It's, it's up in the air at the moment. Though. But it would, if it's allowed to expire, it would be decommissioned as it stands. Thanks, Robert. Uh, Dougie? Thanks, Chair. Um, really comprehensive report, Robert. Um, and it's really not in my nature to be pedantic, although some members might um, disagree with that. But... Um, I'm pretty sure that this site is in Dee and Glen Ken's ward and not Castle Douglas and Crockettford, as stated in the report. Um, I believe we've got a, a, a visualisation that the evidence is that. Uh, I'm sure it's just a, a, a mistake. And it might be my mistake, but um, is it important? That it, well, it is important that we know which ward the site actually is in. You don't need to clarify that today, I don't think, unless you can. I could clarify it today. It's something that's identified at the registration process. And to be honest, Chair, I've never thought to query what was in front of me. So offhand, I don't know the answer because I've never looked into it. I've just gone in good faith in terms of what's been provided at registration stage. But I can certainly find out later if that helps. I let, in fact, all oh, members can just for the sake of it, Robert, just ping an email saying where it actually is, if you don't mind. Uh, Elaine? Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, I appreciate the difficulty of the task you've got and that we've got to, uh, <clears throat> if we were to recommend rejection, we'd have to have appropriate planning uh, reasons for doing so. But I am very perturbed by the reasons for the change recommendation because to me it reads this, because there's a lot of turbines already got in here, we can have some more because the, the, the landscape's already wrecked. You know, and I didn't think that was the purpose of the cumulative uh, assessment of turbine developments that actually there's so many of them here now a few more big ones won't make any difference because that signal to developers more or less says well once you've got a few in you can f stick a few more in put another 20 here another 20 there the landscapes ruined anyway so not, you're not going to be able to to object to it and I, I you know I, I do feel very uncomfortable with that in terms of the way uh, the, the reasons for the change recommendation I think we'll come back to that because it it is quite an interesting question or, or statement. Jane? Um, I have great sympathy with what the leader said. Um, in terms of a question, um, why have we not trialled digital visualisation with SNH, as the Council's landscape architect suggested, or have we? Um, Another question is, can I be absolutely clear? Are we talking about 25 or 35 years here? I, I must confess, I mean, I thought it was a misprint and assumed it was 25. I read 35, but um, I don't absolutely know what we are agreeing to um, in, in this. Um, and um, the, the other point about it, actually, is could you possibly really be clear about what we're agreeing to in terms of lighting, which is also what the uh, Council of Landscape Architect where it said in her November um, letter, she was quite clear that we should be um, asking for a particular type of radar type lighting. 
Um, because I, I, I must admit, I, I think it's incredibly important to get that sort of thing right. Thanks, Jane. I think the, the lifespan is 45 years. I think that's the request. And David will tell you the like one. What is the, what's the length, the duration of the application, Robert? Chair, it's, it's 35 years, 35. It says 25 in the report at 1.10, but that's a typing error. It should have been 35. So 35 duration. Re returning to the points that were raised in terms of the digital visualisation, the, the, the Ventus model referred to by the Council's landscape architect, she views that as desirable. It's got benefits to it. But in terms of the submission that's been done in accordance with SNH guidance for landscape and visual impact assessments, and that approach is still relevant and entirely valid. So we've assessed it on that basis. So there's no difficulty with, with what's been submitted. There is a pilot project at the moment that SNH are trialling, and we've been involved in that, and the landscape architect more so than anyone. And she's keen to explore the opportunities that this Ventus digital visualisation tool will give, but it's still at quite an early stage. The point about the lighting is, in terms of the applicant's further submission, if you look at the report at 1.14, and point L, so that's in page 84. That was a response by the applicant to the comments provided by the Council's landscape architect. So basically saying that it should be determined, assuming there will be no aviation lighting uh, mitigation. So in other words, as they have proposed relative to this, ultimately obviously it's for the Scottish Government to determine that issue. Not sure if that helps. David? Well, I have been involved in some of the discussions of this through the, the Heads of Planning in Scotland, and basically there's a civil aviation authority requirement for any turbines which are more than 150 metres in height to have a, a red visible light on it. Now, that's obviously caused some concerns for planning authorities and Scottish natural heritage across the country. There were discussions very recently with SNH, uh, the CAA, and the Scottish Government to try and get an agreement to change that requirement of the CAA. And whilst we haven't got a final decision on this, they are amenable to the idea of introducing a radar system which is used in the United States, which basically detects civil aviation incoming and then switches on the light for a temporary period. When they've passed by, it goes off again. So that is one of three options. They're looking at other ones, such as dimming them um, during uh, other lighting conditions, so during the daytime or uh, good visibility, they would only be brighter at other times, or having them shielded so they're upward only. The CAA don't like those two, but it sounds like we should be moving forward with having a, a radar detected one. That ultimately would be something that the Scottish Government would attach to any planning permission, and given the timescales, it's likely that that would have been agreed by the CAA by the time that came through. Happy. Okay, no. <laughs> hey, David James, I've got a few members still looking to speak. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> looking at uh, viewpoint seven there, it's um, first of all quite shocking and then uh, quite saddening that we've been put into this position, uh, in position of uh, wind mills all, or wind turbines all over our countryside by a bad and mad government. The question is, well, how do we deal with that? With uh, Case earlier where it was raised that you know we can only fight the battles we can we can win. Um, I would like to ask Robert in his professional opinion that if we were to take a view that um, that area is now an industrial landscape full of uh, wind turbines and therefore under OP1, OP2 accumulation etc. We could take a point that well a few windmills more isn't going to make any difference and that's now the character of that area and then go forward making consistent uh, decisions that way. Is there any chance that we more of our decisions would be then respected when they go up to wherever they go to? Um, and, by, and by following that course, um, we could save some of the untouched touched areas that we still have. I don't know. I'd support that of you. What are you saying? Dumping other stuff in my place and keep yours all right? <laughs> Let, let, let's, have, uh, let's have a sensible conversation here. And we'll not be asking Robert to offer an opinion on that because it's no planning policy. Uh, I've asked the question, please. 
but it's not about planning. It's a personal opinion you're asking. No, no, not at all. You misunderstood me. I, I would like to ask his opinion. We, we, was it Val? It was um, okay. I when someone said, "Yeah, we've got to see it's in context of winning battles." This that. Now, I'd like to know what effect that um, our interpretation of policy has in the chances of our decisions being upheld. Um, well, you're not going to throw, but and Jane made a statement. Didn't they ask a question. Well. Nobody, nobody again, David, we're not asking Robert that question. Uh, Ian Blake. Thank you, Chairman. I've got a lot of sympathy for what David McKee said uh, and the leader. Uh, according to my calculations, I've had 519 existing turbines plus another 300 in, in the planning stage, and this is yet another 20. Uh, when looking at the, the landscape character, Prior to the wind turbines, it was a it was a beautiful landscape character, but it now, as has been said, it's now turning into an industrial zone. So do do we now consider our decision against its present character it being an industrial zone? Robert? In terms of the cumulative development issue, if that's what you're alluding to, you have to make your determination against prevailing circumstances. So what we've done is we've outlined within the report what the situation is with existing schemes. These were modelled in the submitted ES, but obviously things have moved on slightly since then. So when you look at section 1.12 of the report, you'll have, for example, some of the proposed wind farms now have decisions on them or they've been withdrawn, for example, Lockhart and so on. Uh, but you must, when you're looking at cumulative development, you must take into account those that have been built so there aren't that many of those in this area. You've got more decisions that have been consented and as yet built. Now, you don't know if they're going to be built or not, but you have to assume in that scenario that they will come forward because there is the potential there. They've got an unspent permission, if you like. So you have to take it in that context. What you give lesser weight to are proposals that are less advanced than the one you're determining because obviously when you're assessing them, that would, that would be when you would look at the cumulative circumstances at the time of determination. So you, you've basically got to look at everything that's in front of you in terms of that context and try and make a judgment as to whether this proposal is acceptable as part of a bigger picture, if you like, or not. So is the change to the bigger picture in this case enough to warrant refusal of the, this application or not? And that's, as I've said, it's a kind of informed judgment call. But you're determining this case you know, on its own merits and relative to any other kind of concept, you know, you allow something in an area, it's not as if you can horse trade that off against another decision. I'm pretty convinced the planning system will continue with wind turbines to be every case determined on its merits. And applicants obviously have the right to come in and make the applications. It's up to ourselves to determine those, but it will be very much a case of each application on its merits. And it's the same at appeal as well. We win some, we lose some on appeal. I don't know what the ratio is, but we certainly don't lose them all. I suppose for, for, for conversation's sake, when the Sanker 12 went up, the landscape architect said as far as he or she was concerned, that meant this area should have reached saturation point and approved about a dozen since then. And it appears we're still not getting saturation point. Ian Carruthers. Thank you, Chairman. I think I, I really enjoy this debate. I think it's quite a thoughtful debate around about this. When I, when I look at that viewpoint seven, I just see a sea of wind farms. I think the landscape is now industrial, as David's already alluded to. I take into consideration what both uh, Councillor McKee and the Leader of the Council have said. I think it's very relevant, but I think putting into context what we've got proposed in front of us, if we are putting an extra 32, I think it is in there, in that mass uh, of, of uh, wind turbines, then that's probably the best location for them. I don't think we'd win the battle later on. I think the Scottish Government will look at that and think, OK, that is the right place. If we were the final determining body in regards to uh, the, these wind farm applications, it wouldn't look like that. It would look different. We, we, we would probably, I'm just be sure we would have reached a point of saturation by now. So we're not, so I certainly support the recommendations within the report, Chairman. I wouldn't have liked to think William Dean in this room, and you included, would be simply making a decision based on what you think the Scottish Government would decide. We should be deciding here on our position, and then let the Scottish Government decide against that if that's what they choose to do, if we get to that <coughs> position. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Robert, just a couple of questions. Um, one is on decommissioning, and it says on page 80 at the top there that um, the foundations, uh, you go down at least a metre. With these bigger 
turbines, so we'll have um, bigger foundations and probably going deeper. Is that enough when it comes to decommissioning? Because I think, I think we're going to have a landscape littered with concrete plinths, if we're not careful, that are only so far down, and that's not a good thing. Uh, they should be removed completely, I would suggest. The other thing is, um, you, you mentioned something in, in, in part of your presentation about replacing smaller turbines with bigger ones. If, if that happens, if, that, if, if, some, if, if, if a developer wants to do that, do they have to come back and get planning permission for that? Yeah, and the other thing is, I thought that, a rock, that they were in here for our operational life for 25 years. When did it extend to 35? Is that just... I mean, is that just a new thing? I, I, I've obviously missed something. And the other thing is, do we have a bond for decommissioning still? It's never mentioned in the papers, but we always used to. Oh, it's in the papers, the bond thing, but that's it, Robert. Chair, can come back on those four points. In terms of decommissioning of the actual turbine bases, it is fairly standard to remove part of these turbine bases, you know, maybe about a metre down, then you reinstate the land above that and allow it to naturally revegetate in a lot of cases. So you are leaving a lot of the concrete there. I mean, it's basically, it's, a metal, it's reinforced concrete. It's a metal frame that's put in, and then you pour concrete onto that, it sets. So when you're taking it out, the standard approach is not to take out all of the concrete turbine base to take part of it out. So no. that then, what, what, what you're doing then is you, the, the, there's less waste material to dispose of after that, if you like. But to all intents and purposes, the site looks restored. I appreciate there's something buried a metre beneath the ground, but you're not really going to detect otherwise. But just, just on that, Chair, but, but when we agreed the metre, presumably it was when the turbines were smaller, needing less concrete, and not going down so deep. So I just wondered if this, was, this, this policy of a metre was relevant to when we're getting into much, much bigger turbines. It's just really something that allows a layer of soil to generate there. If you take it down to about a metre, you're creating conditions that you know can naturally revegetate, restore itself. So, I mean, turbine foundations for smaller turbines are obviously quite substantial as well, and you would still take off the top part of the foundation. So, in effect, the end result visually is the, the same regardless of the size of turbine base. It's just that for some turbines, you're going to have more of the original concrete foundation beneath the ground. The, the repairing proposal, yes, would have to be a new planning application um, in, in its own right, or indeed a Section 36 application. We're probably going to see quite a few of those happening, but yeah, again, it's each application on its merits. Uh, repairing is quite a big buzzword at the moment, uh, and you are looking at a lot of schemes that are coming up in the 25-year mark when we were led to expect that these turbines would expire. Um, 35 years um, is the intended duration. I mean, again, technology has moved on. Originally, when, again, when you come back to the original stuff like Windy Standard 1, we were led to believe that the best guess timescale of these uh, in terms of their reliability, it was going to be 25 years. But since then, we've had some that have gone beyond that. So what they're saying here is it's a 35-year proposal. The misprint is 25 years, which is standard. It's actually 35 years that was proposed here. Uh, the, the bond, I'm fairly sure, without looking at the appendix, is one of the recommended conditions to the Scottish Government in the event that we don't object. And, and I've got five further members wanting to speak, and then hopefully we can bring the debate to a conclusion. I've got John Young. Thank you, Chair. What concerns me is the, is the sheer size of 60% of these turbines. I mean, there are three times the size of the original Windy Standard 1. And I also note that the legislation was made in the Electricity Act in 1989 that if the generating capacity was over 50 megawatts, then it goes first of all to the Scottish ministers for a decision. And I'm just wondering if the inclusion of such huge turbines got it over this 50 megawatts, and if they had more normal size, around about 125, 140, would it have fallen before that and the whole system of planning would have changed? Robert? Um, going back to 1989, I, mean, I was still at school at the time, so I don't know for sure, and I wasn't involved in the preparation of the legislation, but it was certainly before we had any real wind farms of scale onshore in this country. Uh, the first proposal really started, of any commercial scale, started to break cover in the early to mid-1990s. Uh, turbines then were quite different. They tended to be 500 kilowatt machines. I mean, the good example of an early scheme at Windy Standard 1, just near to this one, in which you saw in some of the photo montages. 
Um, I don't think, in 1989, I don't think the government probably envisaged that you'd eventually one day have wind farms of such a scale as this coming forward under the terms of that Act. I think it was more geared up to nuclear power. And in the event that you know a nuclear power plant was proposed within a local authority area and that local authority objected, it would then trigger a PLI. So everyone would have their say. Yes, thank you, Robert. I just wondered if a developer could create a situation that designed a wind farm of such magnitude that it goes on a different planning route <coughs> rather than coming to us here first in Dumfries and Galloway Council. Sorry, Chair. Um, in terms of the Electricity Act 1989, if it's a wind farm that has an ocean generating capacity of over 50 megawatts, uh, the application is dealt with by Scottish ministers. So they issue it a consent under the Electricity Act. At the same time, they issue a deemed planning permission as well. So they are the planning authority, and then they consult local authorities at that same point in time. If it's less than 50 megawatts, now you, you were saying, what if they were 20 turbines, each 125 metres? I would have expected in that scenario that it would still have generating capacity of around about 60 megawatts. So it would still have been a Section 36 application. But if they had, say, 10 at 3 megawatts and it was a 30 megawatt scheme that was in front of you, that would be subject of a planning application. It would also be a major planning application because it would be over 20 megawatts. If it was, for example, five turbines at 3 megawatts and it was 15 megawatts in total, it would be actually a, a local planning application. So we wouldn't necessarily need to come in front of you as members unless it was subject to six objections or objection from a statutory consultee or it was called in. So that, I hope that helps explain. But basically, if it's a wind farm over 50 megawatts, it comes in in Scotland under the terms of the Electricity Act and it's the Scottish Government that are the determining body, so we're acting as a statutory consultee today. Given that the Act's 30 years old, maybe the Scottish Government needs to review the capacity and that might lighten their load and, and, and allow us a better... A control over what's happening in our area. Chef Lever. Thank you, Chef. I, I think if this had been a, uh, an application for housing development, it would have probably been refused in as far as it's out with the, um, uh, the settlement boundary. But the problem is we don't have any boundaries in terms of this, so what we've got effectively is uh, development creep all the time. And the way the, uh, the technology is developing, I could foresee another application coming forward for 225 metre high turbines and we'd say, well, that's been mitigated because they're being built next to 175 metre, 177.5 metre turbines because we're saying effectively that the, the fact they're being built next to 100 metre high turbines is mitigating the effect and I don't think it is. We're just going to have this continual creep all the time, the, uh, the technology. So I think the, uh, the capacity of the landscape here is saturated and I agree with that. Uh, uh, with David, you know, enough is enough. It'll just keep on going all the time as more and more turbines come into these areas. I agree. Uh, Katie? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just actually looking for some clarification on, with, in terms of the consultation. Obviously, we're being consulted as Dumfries and Galloway Council. Are we in turn asking our community councils for their opinion or do, are they being consulted directly via Scottish Government? And my second question is, if we were to raise an objection, how would that happen? How would that work, just as a point of clarity? Robert. Chair, in relation to the first point, in, in terms of a Section 36 application, we are a statutory consultee. There are other consultees, and obviously the public have the right to make their thoughts known to the Scottish Government too. So community councils can make their comments directly to the Scottish Government and they should do that. It's slightly different to normal because normally we would consider all material considerations, including the representations made to us, the consultation responses externally and so on and so forth, because we are the planning authority, we are issuing the planning decision. In this case, we're not the planning authority, it's the Scottish Government and it's them that's consulting us in the same way that we would seek views from others. So it's slightly different. Um, but yes, if any other parties want to engage in this process, they should do so directly to the Scottish Government. Um, sorry, what was the second point again? If we refuse. Oh, sorry. If, if you're minded to object to this proposal formally, you would need to formally write to the Scottish Government and provide it as a, as a written consultation response. We've done that in the past. It's obviously 
you know, a matter that members can decide they want to do. Um, but you would make that in writing and you, your grounds would need to be clear and going forward because it would be an objection from the host council, if you like, you know, those would be the points upon which you would make your case at the inquiry. <coughs> And it would trigger a public inquiry, Kate. That would be the, the ultimate outcome. I've now got Jane wanting to speak, so I'm going to do three, and then we'll try and get some consensus or some way forward. Andy Fergus. Um, thanks very much. Um, Katie's kind of touched on what I was going to ask here, because I can understand the conversation, I can understand what this has been uh, happening across the room, the concerns people have got. But our job today is actually whether we're going to... Um, follow the recommendations in here or not, you know, and I, I, and I think Robert gave part of the answer that I was looking for in terms of the public inquiry. And the, the clarity that we need is when that local inquiry is, what part do we play in that, if any, um, and what input and what extra would we actually achieve from that? Because I'm looking at Appendix 1 and I'm surprised nobody in the room has yet has asked any questions in Appendix 1 where the very considered conditions that we, we would recommend to ministers if they were minded to, to, um, to, to approve the application. So if we go to a public inquiry situation, are we still in the position at that stage to put in recommended conditions in the, um, to the to ministers? Um, would that be included in a communication to them or would it just purely be alerted in, in the grounds for our, our um, our objection. I'll ask David and Nick to between them answer you. I remember being involved in one before. Normally the chair of the planning committee, governance, a chief officer, I think, and others. I don't think it was across the council on the one that I attended. And I don't know about the rest of the committee. Well, I would imagine the Scottish Government could ignore our recommendations anyway, the same as could overturn any proposal they might have made. But David and, and Nick between you, can you answer Andy, please? Yes, certainly, Chair. Basically, if a, a, the Council were to object, it would trigger a public local inquiry. The Council would be asked if it wished to make representations at that. So, because as officers we have supported um, the idea of not objecting, then we wouldn't be able to assist, but there would have to be representation either from yourselves um, or from a professional party that's employed to represent the Council. Uh, which is why I would suggest that obviously you need to, if you are minded to object to it, you need to have very clear grounds because it's those grounds which uh, would need to be defended at the public inquiry. As with any appeal, you, the, the objector or the appellant has to produce a list of uh, conditions that they would be seeking. Now, they're not binding on the, the Scottish ministers, but what we've taken here, the, there's a list of standard conditions which the Energy Consent Unit to the Scottish Government has, so these are basically following them. Uh, as Robert alluded to, the, the ones which were omitted in the papers because we didn't have them at the time were the noise ones, but we've now got those details. So, yes, there would have to be conditions submitted and the Scottish minister can decide which ones they're, they're taking of those if they're minded to approve it. At the end. Uh, two more speakers, Jim and then Jane. Thanks, Chair. On page 85, the landscape architect recommends no micrositing allowance should be built into any consent. But yet, when you go to the conditions on page 107, we see that a micrositing allowance of 50 metres is actually mentioned there. My question is, why was the recommendation of the landscape architect ignored? Robert? Thanks, Chair. It wasn't something that was ignored. I thought quite carefully about this one. It's fairly standard to have a 50 metre micrositing allowance without requiring to consult with the Council. Uh, for example, if you encounter on-site constraints that you haven't picked up in your baseline surveys and so on and so forth, you're allowed to move turbines to a certain degree. Going beyond the 50 metre mark, it's normal to require the local authority to agree to that before you microsite. But yeah, no, I did see that. I did think about it and thought, well, should we have no micrositing at all? 
as a condition, but that would then make it out of kilter with other wind farms. What's the worst thing that could happen if you microsited 50 metres? It might be in a slightly different location, but you know, on this scale of development, 50 metres is a very small variation, and on that basis, I didn't agree that we should remove micrositing completely by condition. There is a concept of non-material variations to planning permission, so in other words, you can change it very slightly at a later date without requiring a further planning application, and it's akin to what we would have in the micrositing condition. So I did think about it, but I thought it would be unreasonable in this case. I couldn't see the justification for not allowing a limited amount of micrositing in, in each case where it was necessary. Jim? The landscape architect does indeed provide a fairly good rationale why there should be no micrositing. The rationale is given on page 85. And again, it's up to members whether or no they want to uh, introduce that particular opinion into recommendations, whether it be to, to refuse or, 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 sorry, if we decide to support the thing. Uh, Jane Maitland. Um, I'm aware that members are wriggling and wanting their lunch, but actually, um, Robert, Robert pointed out this, this is um, as a result of a game changer. We've had Ben Brack and South Kyle um, put in, and we've also got the biggest um, um, wind turbines being requested that we've ever had before. I, I just don't completely understand. I'm looking for a hook, to be absolutely honest. Um, I don't understand about the guidance on our very large typologies. Um, we apparently have said that um, the study we did to support our LDP, which is out for discussion, uh, currently suggests um, that um, anything, any turbines, and I quote, towards 200 metres high to blade tip would be too large to be accommodated as new developments anywhere except Eskdale Muir. Now, that, that's apparently um, what our study said. Um, and we've got the problem, though, that our landscape type, this one here, 19A, suggests that there is some capacity for very large turbines. So, I mean, is there, a, is there a, a slight contradiction in the study we did, which said that Estelle Muir is the only place that's suitable to accommodate them, but at the same stage, our landscape capacity type, 19A here, suggests that I think there is some scope to put them in, high to, but it's high to medium sensitivity in that particular area. I mean, my worry is that if we don't actually, really, I suppose, really just, just put down a line in the sand at some stage, um, the assumption will be that we will get applications in on a rolling basis for 35 years for 200 metres, just because we are unprotected by any national parks or anything. And I can't help thinking that um, if there is a hook, um, I would suggest to members that it's only by, by hanging our <laughs> coat on it at some stage that we've got any chance of saying, look, hang on a second, guys, this is not going to roll forward un unstopped. Okay, I'm sure we're getting a proposal from you, Jane. You had got to the last. David, Jane wants to speak. James wants to speak. Then I am going to put it to a, a conclusion. David. Thank you. I, I'm still concerned that he didn't let Robert answer my first question because we're only a consultee here. It's not like our normal planning decision-making process, and I think it, we could decide whatever. Um, we, we want, whatever procedure we wanted as a potential objector, what our strategy is in the wider picture of other um, wind farm developments. So I don't agree with the original decision, but could I ask a somewhat similar question? Um, is there a sort of a quota type approach from the Scottish Government whereby, you know, if we said um, yes to this one, there's a, it would decrease the chances of uh, uh, one coming, one being allowed in a um, another area. You know, is there a view that Dumfries and Galloway has to take a certain amount of these? Or um... David Elisher, I hope we're not trying to suggest we have a barter system here. In a word, no. There, there is no quota. There never has been, and this is uh, certainly a bone of contention with many planning authorities. Is that never has been provided. The only guidance we have from the Scottish Government is what's set out in the Scottish Planning Policy. And it makes it clear that the only two areas where we shouldn't be considering wind farms are in the areas where there's national parks or it's a national scenic area. So, in short, everything else is fair game. If we were to try and unilaterally have a, 
a sacrificial area, there is a risk that applications could come in, in the areas that you want to protect, and you then find that that's approved, so you've got the worst of both worlds. So we've got a motion from Ian Carruthers to accept of his recommendation, is that right? I said I would support the recommendation, Chair, and he said proposed to, to agree, but I mean, certainly, uh, if it comes to that point, I would, but I certainly, I still, my view, I still look at the same viewpoint, view, view, viewpoint of an saturation. It's like throwing a, a, a handful of sand, in my, in my view, a handful of sand at a, at a sandy beach. It makes no difference, almost, in my view. So we're obviously finished with officers, uh, questions to officers. We are now in session. Members. David McKee. Sorry, Chair, I think we're behind the eight ball here. And uh, what I'd like to ask, and it's, it's something for the officers to do out with this, because it's out with their control, but can they get national discussions to look at overcapacity, accumulation of wind tur turbines in specific areas? It's something we've not got to do here today. But given the comments that's been said here today, I think it's something that we need to look at as a council and a planning department. Um, I think uh, I'm not happy to accept this uh, this proposal here, but I think we've kind of much option much to go with it. I wouldn't say that was the case. We wouldn't need to sit here if that was the case. We're here to decide whether or no we like the officer's recommendation. If so, we're going to accept it, and if no, we're going to put it in its place. Archie. Well, thanks very much, here. I think I think you're right there. Things like this need to come in front of us. We have that discussion and, and, and put things forward. I am very much against this um, proposal, and, 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 and the recommendation I would go forward is that we do not um, support this, this, or we object to this application uh, under OP1, which is development considerations. And it's our consideration that there is overdevelopment uh, in, in that particular part of the region. Um, it's all work in Ghana at the moment, but it's a difficult one to say that. Um, I, I believe that the, the, the cumulative effect of all of that is that we are now in a position where we are, uh, our, our, our countryside is becoming an industrial playfield, and it's not, not happening. David seems to have found some words that will help you. I see Jane wanting to speak as well. Did you want this as well, David, James? No. Okay. Chair, if I can assist, I would suggest OP1 is, n I know why you're saying that one, but it's probably not the appropriate one because there is a specific policy on wind energy, which is policy IN2. And in part one of that, it does list a number of headings. There's landscape and visual impact. The second one is cumulative impact. So if you have concerns, then I would suggest that really you would be objecting on the grounds that it's contrary to uh, policy IN2 in that the cumulative visual impact of the the scale of this development in the context means effectively that you have reached saturation point. I'm, I'm happy with that. I think there's an, a train of thought for me as well. What, you, you know, it's this place today, it might be somewhere else tomorrow that you don't particularly like yourselves. Jane? Could I also ask about the, um, um, well, actually, I suppose, uh, depending on what, what the, pro the proposal, because I think Ian was proposing to agree it. Um, and if that's the case, um, is there still a consideration we should, we should agree to the 35 years? Could I ask through you, Chairman, what is being proposed? Who are you asking, David? All oh, right, Ian. In, uh, on the back, my, my understanding of the 35 years is different from what uh, Robert said. So, I mean, on the back of Robert said, I'm happy to support the 25 years and change it and even look at further conditions that we would like to see being imposed thereafter as well. There was a couple that through my mind, but I'd obviously like to hear that coming out through, through the, the debate. But no, I'm more than happy to support it reducing from 30 for that. Our recommendation would be subject to certain conditions. So we, we agree with it, we, uh, absolutely subject to conditions like it should be 25 years, not 35 years. And there's others, uh, but I'll hear what Jane's got to say first, Chairman. Jane. Um, no, no thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I'm just curious that um, that cumulative um, would be adequate in this particular instance. Uh, um, 
Uh, right. Well, I'm very happy to go along with Councillor Dreiber's proposal, actually, um, if it will fly. But <laughs> You're second in Archer Dreiber. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering about the, uh, the issue of um, the, the fact that there is, um, there is impact on the, the viewpoint one from point of view of tourism um, and, um, and the effect of a sensitive receptor. Um, and you could see on that viewpoint one what the effect was going to be um, and I don't know whether there is anything that ought to be added to the cumulative issue um, with respect to um, what, what the impact is from that viewpoint I, I, I don't know whether that's an appropriate thing to say I've got David James, Andrew Juste and uh, Jeff Lieber want to speak but in the meantime you might want to speak to Archie and see if he wants to add the height issue to your uh, objection because an issue about height as well that you raised Jane that seems to me quite a reasonable uh, argument. David James. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, you yourself pointed out it'll be, we don't know where the next application is going to be, and but certainly there will be, will be more. Um, since, our, as I understand it, our planning committee is a, a consultee and can make objections, um, and, but we can't, within a particular case, dis, uh, uh, discuss our strategy. Wouldn't it make sense for us to, at some point, out with a planning case to actually discuss our strategy and how we want to interpret our local development plan. We've just did that at full council. The strategy was part of the local development plan. That's what we did. That's what you guys all agreed. We sit here to interpret the local development plan as far as I know. And so, but you know, even though we have a local development plan, there are different views here. But I just think we'd have a chance to have more impact, get more of our. Uh, positions respected if we had a more united view and a more thought out view. But we never have a chance to actually reach that. That would be unique having a, a united view. Andrew? Chair, um, I would like to pro propose an amendment that would go with the officer's recommendations. Can you repeat that? Sorry. I would like to propose an amendment that would go with the officer's recommendations. I'd like to go with the recommendations. Yeah, I think obviously in terms of the landscape, the most obvious uh, effect is the turbines when you're looking horizontally. But if you look vertically, all these yeah, um, turbines are connected by roadways as well. So not only have we uh, got the visual impact of the turbines, but it's a scarring of the landscape by putting this uh, lace work of uh, roadworks in there. In terms of um, the, the grounds for the... Uh, Objecting to the um, the uh, application, I think basically all we need to do is to just to turn the uh, the conclusion upside down. As far as we uh, um, on the the grounds laid out in the the conclusion, we object to the uh, um, the application. Now we currently have a proposal that Archie and Jane have put together, and you're wanting to add to it, Jeff. Or he just made an observation. Well, I throw in the effect of the uh, the roadway works as well. Well, we'll get David to we'll get David to. SDL Muir. Um, so, so therefore, this is not SDL Muir. We'll try not to complicate things too much, though. Uh, we've got Andrew, who has put up an amendment to the motion. We've got Andy Ferguson wanting to speak. I'm happy to second Andrew's use. Right. So, we currently have a motion to refuse this application based on cumulative effect, height, and topography, and roads issues. You, you, let's put that together, David. Well, we're trying to pull together what you're saying. I, I'm suggesting that if you are minded to object to it, then you're looking at policy IN2 on wind energy, and it would have an adverse, unduly adverse effect as a result of the cumulative impact of the, the number of turbines in the proximity. And the particular very large turbine typology is such that it would have an unduly 
adverse visual impact, especially from uh, sensitive viewpoints such as uh, Cairnsmore of Cars Fairn. I would suggest we probably shouldn't go down the, the effect of the, the access tracks because there already are access tracks to Windy Standard 1 and 2 and therefore the, the effect would be limited compared to other things which I think you, you have, but feel free to add it to the list if you want. Okay, Ian Carruthers, do you want a counter amendment? No, no, it wasn't a chair. My point was actually on the cumulative effect and should we be asking as, as if we were referring and saying, listen, we don't object, but should, should ask for a condition that we, we cap it at this point, but that's on, th on thinking about, uh, I think it's probably more for the local development plan as we go forward. We've got a wind farm capacity, landscape capacity study, but even if there's any advice in regards to that, whether I'm heading in the right direction or no, but this is an opportunity to make a statement to the Scottish Government to say, listen, if so, if this does go through uh, and we don't object and it, they, they decide to, to, to grant it, then subject to certain conditions, because that is an industrial landscape, whether that's there or not at this moment in time. Okay. Uh, David, did you hear what Ian said? I think they had to put the recommendation out, no? Uh, well, sorry, just for clarification, Chair, I've, I've scribbled down so far that we've got an amendment from Councillor Justy, second by Councillor Ferguson, to move the recommendation, and then the motion is Councillor Drybra, uh, second by Councillor Maitland, for the grounds to object. That was just said. So, so, is there another one? No, 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 that's, no, what no. Was, that's what I was verifying. There's not any more. So it's uh, Councillor Justy and Councillor Ferguson have moved a uh, to approve as per the Office of recommendation. The motion, though is to refuse based on the grounds that we seem to have been able to put together with some collective uh, thinking amongst the committee. So the motion is to notify the Scottish Government that we object and the amendment. But Ian, uh, Ian Nick, you just confirm what this, what the motion amendment is, please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, the, so the motion... Um, as moved by Councillor Driver and seconded by Councillor Maitland, is to submit an objection to the proposals in that the proposals are contrary to policy IM2, um, that there would be an adverse cumulative visual impact, and furthermore that the height and typology of the um, turbines proposed is, is inappropriate. Yeah. Members content with that? Ian? It was only, I felt just, the, the point I was trying to get across was that I support Councillor Justy and Ferguson. We, 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 are we able to actually add a condition that says, or ask, ask for them to put in a recommendation? And it was clarity in regards to that. I, I could either make a further amendment or come to an amendment or ask the, the, men, the, the, the proposer in the secondary of the amendment to add that to theirs. It, just in regards to, I'd just like clarity from David if possible. Can we ask for something like that as part of that amendment? Say, listen, we've actually, we're full up here now. This is an industrial landscape. We're at capacity. What is it you're but, asking for? Just can we ask, as, as, if we are saying we don't object, but we'd ask for particular right, when it comes to, the, they'll put conditions on. I think that's clarity we've got earlier. We can ask for conditions to be to be put forward as a recommendation. I mean, to, to me, a subject to if, if this is agreed, it's at capacity. That's the point I'm trying to get to. I feel it's at capacity. It's it's done. It's no more should be in there. That's maybe maybe the answer straightforward. No, we can't do that. But I'd like the clarity. Uh, Chair, no. Basically, each one would have to be considered on own merits. So no, you couldn't have a blanket thing. Obviously, the what's in the appendix here are the conditions that we'd be putting forward. Uh, but they are only the council's view on that, and therefore the Scottish ministers are the ones who could amend, delete, or whatever as they see fit in the final decision. You did also say that uh, at one stage you supported Councillor Maitland's proposal that's limited to 25 year. Councillor Juice is asking for 35 year. You'll forget that, right, Ivor? Just to clarify that last point. Uh, Mr. Sutty said that the recommendations or the conditions were as per the appendix that clearly states 25 years. I take it that 35 years should carry forward to the recommendations as well. Yes, that, thank you for giving me that opportunity. Yes, it should say 35. And also, as Robert made clear earlier, we've got a whole load of environmental health um, noise conditions which we didn't have before, so they would have to go in as part of it. Okay, Nick, can we go to the, the, the vote, please? 
We get we remind everybody again. Motion amendment. Thank you, Chair. Yep. Yeah. So the 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 motion um, to submit an objection to the Scottish Government that the proposal would be contrary to policy IM2 um, in terms of an adverse and cumulative impact. Um, also, that the height and the typology of the um, proposed turbines was in, inappropriate for the location proposed. The David's got a note of that, yeah. Yep. And the, amend the amendment being that um, there be no, no objection raised. Councillor Dempster. Motion. Councillor Campbell. Amendment. Councillor, Councillor Blake. Motion. Councillor Doogie Campbell. Motion. Councillor Carruthers. Amendment. Councillor Driver. Motion. Councillor Ferguson. Amendment. Councillor Gilroy. Councillor Juicy. Amendment. Councillor Hagman. Amendment. Councillor Hislop. Councillor James. Councillor Lever. Motion. Councillor Maitland. Motion. Councillor Martin. Motion. Councillor McComb. Motion. Councillor McKee. Motion. Councillor Murray. Motion. Councillor Young. Motion. Okay, so voting is as follows. We have 12 members voting in favour of the amendment. Six, sorry, 12 voting in favour of the motion. Six voting in favour of the amendment and one abstention. Therefore, the motion is carried. So an ob objection will be submitted on the, on the basis um, outlined. Thank you, Nick. And we come to agenda item nine, which is a item for noting an appeal to Scottish Ministers that was dismissed. And I have no further business. Thank you very much, members, for your indulgence and your attendance today.